the tournament, your faithful friend with muscles ache and pain, presents... Gangbusters! Gangbusters, brought to you, the men and women of America, by the makers of Sloan's yeah, Liniment. With the cooperation of leading law enforcement oh, officials of the United States, the beginning of the show? Gangbusters presents no, no. facts in the well, relentless war of the police on the underworld. Okay. You're Authentic you're case histories yeah. that show the never-ending activity of the police and their work of protecting yeah, our citizens. Really? America's crusade the against crime. Now, for those of you who are familiar with the name Schwarzkopf, just an editorial note, and we'll get right back to the program. Colonel Schwarzkopf, who uh, oftentimes interviews the uh, uh, lawman who brings in the story to gangbusters, is, of course, uh, in actuality, uh, the father of H. Norman Schwarzkopf, general of the United States Army, uh, and so this is kind of interesting to hear him portrayed, uh, his father portrayed as a law enforcer. And also interesting, uh, there's a, uh, the character of the lawman, a sheriff, uh, I'm sorry, a judge who comes on the program, Judge Miller, is played by none other than Bill Johnstone, who about the same time was playing The Shadow on the Mutual Network. So there's a couple of interesting voices to listen for here. Now for our proxy interview between Colonel Schwarzkopf and Judge L.D. Miller of Chattanooga, Tennessee. Picture our setting as a special office turned over to gangbusters by Commissioner Louis J. Valentine of the New York City Police. Colonel Schwarzkopf. Judge Miller, I understand that Charlson and Rogers, the nickel and dime bandits, were hunted by the police of six states. Yes, Colonel Schwarzkopf. Actually, eight different police departments were after them within a period of 30 days. But why do you call these particular criminals the nickel and dime bandits? Well, Colonel, James Carlson, the brains of the combination, had a theory of crime different from any criminal in all my experience. I got a new slant on stick-ups that'll pay big dividends. I'm going to get me a smart partner that knows how to use a gift. Then we're going to go through the Mississippi Valley pulling little jobs, nickel and dime jobs. When we pulled enough of these nickel and dime jobs, we'll have just as much jack as if we'd stuck up a dozen big banks. On December 4th, 1939, following a term at Minnesota State Reformatory, Charlson drove up to a roadside tavern near Minneapolis. The owner was talking to a customer. Be right with you, mister. Anything else, sir? Oh, that'll be all, Bill. Charge it, will you? <laughs> with a fancy car like that, you want me to charge it? <laughs> no fancy right behind you, pal. Turn around. What? Look out, Bill. He's got a gun. A special kind of gun, mister, with a hair trigger. Come on, both of you. Back up into that hot dog joint before I turn this cannon loose on you. I want your dough. Oh, I got some change. Give it to me. Here you are. Now you, open up a cash register. Here, 35 bucks, it's all I got. I know it ain't. Scoop out that change and stick it in my pocket. Nickels and dimes, huh? I'd like to see you for five minutes without that gun. Here's a change. Thanks, white guy. Now get out of here. Not so fast, you. Empty your pockets. Uh, pretty brave, aren't you, with a gun? Yeah, and it's liable to go off any minute. No sort of punk's gonna take my dough. I want your white guy. Bill! You're not getting away from me! I'll show you! Give me that gun! You're all through! Let go of me! Bill, you hurt? Let go of me! Yeah, I guess so. Pretty bad. I dropped all three of those bullets, but I got his gun. You're gonna need a doctor. What do we do with this guy? Lock him in the washroom. Yeah, you make it all right? Yeah, sure. Now, I got the special gun, you rat. Right. Yeah. Give me back my money. All right. Here you are. Now, come on. You're in the washroom. You'll never get me to jail. Inside, punk. Okay, white guy. I'll lock it and then phone the police. Better get an ambulance, Bill. 
You're being bad. Hello. Hello, operator. Get me the police. Sit down, Bill. What's that? The washroom window. There. Up front. There he goes. He's in his car. Stop. Stop or I'll shoot. Oh, it's jammed. That guy's special pistol jammed and saved his own life. It is rare, Judge Miller, for the victim to turn on his assailant at gunpoint and disarm him. It is, Colonel. Fortunately, the wounds of the tavern owner were not serious. Johnson made a dash for Chicago, where he went into partnership with another criminal named Joe Rogers. Together, they stole a late model car and started south, blazing a trail of robberies from Illinois to Louisiana. On the night of December 17th in Blytheville, Arkansas... Charleston and Rogers committed an unusual robbery, showing a peculiar obsession. Blytheville, Arkansas. Robbery. Two men broke into a house and stole a large collection of pistols, automatics, shotguns, and rifles. Seen escaping in blue or black Dodge sedan. Notify all gun dealers to be on lookout for unusual weapons of foreign make. A few days later, Colonel, Charlson and Rogers were in Minneapolis, waiting in a stolen new Buick sedan across the street from a small apartment house. <laughs> Boy, this is the life of Rogers. You said it, Charlson. Cops and newspapers screaming about us from here to New Orleans. <laughs> Nothing for us to do but sit back and take it easy. <laughs> sure like a drink right now. Yeah, so would I. Wish that baby ears would hurry up. Uh, it's only ten past eleven. I told her to sneak out a quarter past. She made up her mind to come with us? Hope so. You know me, Rogers. Wine woman and song. Yeah, I know. But when are we going to quit this small time stuff and go after something big? Like what? Banks. Forget it, Rogers. Knock over a bank and every cop in the state's after you. Just think of the dough we could pick up in banks. Oh, we've been getting to places you pick us chicken feed. Nothing but nickels and dimes. There's nothing you can't buy with nickels and dimes, Rogers. If you got enough of them, sure, but we could. There's no but to it. It adds up, see? And the rap for little jobs is nothing like it is for a bank. But in one bank job, we... Listen, sap. Hey, take it easy, will you? Banks have guards, and the guards have guns and tear gas. They have balconies to ambush bank bandits. And they have burglar alarms to call the cops. Don't you see? We can get as much in a flock of gas stations as we could in a dozen banks. And no risk. Eh, uh, maybe you're right. The way I figure it... Hold it, Charleston. Here comes your girlfriend. Oh. Hello, baby. Hello, Jim. Gee, I'm glad to see you. You and me both. Get in the car. Okay. It's my pal, Joe Rogers. Oh, pleased to meet you. How are you? Oh, what's up? Where are we going? We're going south, kid. How'd you like to go with us? South? Oh, gee, I'd love to, but what about my folks? <laughs> Send them a postcard. Yeah. Just say, having a wonderful time. I wish you were here. <laughs> Hey, what are you guys going to do? We got special ideas. Swell clothes, good liquor, and plenty to keep us busy. What do you say? I say, what are we waiting for? Baby, you're going to be perfect. Let's go, Rogers. Where to? Back to New Orleans, where it's nice and warm. We're going to make some stops on the way. And where we stop, nobody's ever going to forget us. This will be a joy ride to remember. That was near midnight, Colonel, on December 21st, 1939. Three days later, Chief C.R. Bryan of the Chattanooga, Tennessee Police was sitting in his office when Police Captain Homer Edmondson walked in with a message in his hand. Good morning, Captain. Good morning, Chief Bryan. This just came in on the teletype. Thought you'd like to look at it. From Sweetwater, huh? Yes, sir. Arrest two men wanted here for robbery of roadside cafe this morning, 3 a.m. One man about 20, weight 150, blue eyes, light hair. The other one, older, weight about 140, dark hair, slender. Both bandits wearing leather jackets. That's a pretty complete description, Chief. These bandits took $60 in currency, cigarettes, liquor, and a large amount of nickels and dimes. They're heavily armed. Large amount of nickels and dimes, that sounds familiar. You're right, Captain. This is the sixth report in the last few days that used those exact words. Yes, and each report was near Chattanooga. Have you broadcast this message to the patrol cars? Yes, sir. Right after we came in. Send it out again, Captain. This is the first good description we've had of those men. 
If they try anything here, I want every man on the force to be waiting for them. Right, Chief. Wait a second. Chief Bryan speaking. Assistant cops over quit, Chief. I've just been robbed. Who's this? Jack Parker. I got a filling station at Maiden Watkins. I just opened up ten minutes ago and two guys walked in and... Hold on a minute. Captain, there's been a hold-up over at Maine and Watkins, a filling station. Send a patrol car over there right away. Right away, Chief. Go ahead, Mr. Parker. What happened? These two guys walked in, Chief. They both wore leather jackets. They had four guns between them, and they cleaned out the cash register. How much did they get? Seven bucks. Almost all small change. Nickels and dimes, huh? Well, I know it don't sound like much, Chief, but it's a lot to me. Mr. Parker, I don't care if it was seven cents or seven million dollars. If these bandits are the men I think they are, they're going to try to pull some more jobs like this here in Chattanooga, and we're going to get them. The next afternoon, Colonel, the woman manager of a small dry goods store in Chattanooga saw two men, apparently customers, walking into her store. May I help you, gentlemen? Yeah. Let me see some shirts. The best you got. And I want to see some socks and ties. Certainly. Right over here. What size shirt, sir? Fifteen collar, thirty-four sleeves. And I want size eleven socks. Here they are. Just take your pick. That's just what we're going to do, sister. Stick them up. <laughs> Hold up. Take it easy, sister. One peep out of you and I'll drill you. Please. Get down on the floor behind our counter. And don't move if you want to live. Yes, sir. Pretty, pretty fancy looking socks, pal. Get some for me. And the shirts you're getting. Silk. The most expensive I can find. Oh, please. Fast. Okay. Here's your look swell. Green silk. You ready, pal? Yeah, let's go. Hey, sister, where's your cash register? There, in the back of the counter. But there's only a... I know, I know. There's only a little change. That's what they all say. How much, pal? Ten bucks and about five and change. Thanks for the service, lady. We'll be sure to tell our friends about you. And remember, sister, if you move off that floor before or out of this store, it'll be the last time you ever move. Exactly 44 minutes later, Colonel, in a Chattanooga liquor store on the other side of town... Uh, will that be all, gentlemen? Just the three bottles of whiskey? No, that ain't all, mister. Reach for the ceiling. Hey, what do you want? Don't shoot him, pal. The cops might hear you get. All right. Keep him covered. Hey, what are you going to do? I'm going to teach you not to be so nosy. Oh, oh. That'll teach you to ask me what I want. No, 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 please. No, please. Please don't kick me again. Hey, come on, pal. Let's get out of here. Get the dough. Okay. Take everything, even a small change. How much is it? Yeah, there's about 90 bucks here. Hey, here's something else, pal. A nice new gap for your collection. Say, not so bad. Different from any I got. Maybe I ought to try it out on this wise guy. No, no, please. Okay, please. mister, but just so you won't run after us, here's something more to remember us. But. Oh. That brutal holdup was the third the nickel and dime band is committed in the heart of Chattanooga within 24 hours, Colonel. It redoubled the efforts of the police to catch Charleston and Rogers and resulted in a gun battle that Chattanooga will long remember. Law enforcement officers within a radius of 50 miles of Chattanooga cooperated. At a special meeting of police representatives at the office of Chief C.R. Bryant, all possible angles were discussed. Unfortunately, men, we have a complete description of these two bandits and definite identification clues. What are they, Chief Bryant? Well, first, Tussman, there's the nickel and dime angle. So anyone seen spending an unusual amount of silver is a definite suspect. Then there's the gun angle. The gun angle? It's this, Frazier. These men are crazy about guns. They take pride in them. Not just as weapons, but as items to collect. Ooh, so the bandits might just show off their guns sometime without staging a holdup, huh? Particularly if they've been drinking. That's still another clue, Chief Bryan. The amount of liquor they consume, judging by the amount they've stolen. And the girl with them, the one that's been seen in their car. Now, we have her description. All right, Captain Edmondson. These are all valuable clues, men. And we have one other advantage. From what these bandits have said to their victims, they don't expect the police to go after them seriously. Just because the thefts have been relatively small, huh? Exactly. Hmm. That gives me an idea, Chief. What is it, Edmondson? Maybe we can get these bandits through a weakness in their own system. How, oh, Captain? Let's give these clues to every reliable citizen in the vicinity of Chattanooga. Every small storekeeper. Then when the bandits do show up again, they'll be spotted immediately. Good yeah, 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 yeah. idea. Yeah. Well, then it's understood every available man is to stay on duty till these bandits are behind bars. I want them in custody before somebody gets killed. Within one hour after that meeting, Colonel, merchants, filling station employees, liquor store proprietors, business people all over Chattanooga... We're planning to cooperate with the police. Cooperate with police? 
Listen, I'm staying right here at the store. If those bandits come back this way, I'm going to be ready for them. If this is the old nickel and dime crooks come anywhere near me, I'm going to call the police. I'll know them if I ever see them again. I'll be glad to cooperate. I've got a score to settle with those rats, and I'd like to see them both behind bars. If they ever come into my place, I'll... Nickels and dimes, eh? I get it. If those buzzards stick their noses in my place, I'll be waiting for them. You can count on me. That night, Colonel, December 26, 1939, at the Rock Castle Roadhouse, ten miles west of Chattanooga, the cashier, Bill Rafer, was standing behind his counter. <laughs> Hey, yo, cashier. Yes, sir? I want a bottle of whiskey. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. We're not allowed to sell liquor in bottles, except the guests of Rock Castle. I'm a guest here. Me and my pal are in one of the cabins right next door. Oh, I beg your pardon. Sure. Uh, here you are. That'll be uh, 165, please. You'll have to take it and change. Change? Fiscal, buddy. Here. 25, 50, dollar, 10, 20, 30, 55, 65. Right. Thank you, sir. Your brother's right. Say, what are you staring at? Oh, why, I... See anything wrong with me? No, I... I was just thinking what a good-looking green silk shirt you have on. Oh, that, yeah. Yeah, it is good-looking. Everything I got's good-looking. Look at this. Hey, hey, what? Ah, don't be scared. I ain't gonna use it on you. Boy, that's some pistol. (laughs) Bet your life it is. Special automatic... Only one like it in the country. Yes, sir. Well, I- is there anything else you want? Yeah, yeah, sure. I almost forgot. Give me, uh, give me uh, some of those box lunches you got, huh? How many? Let's see now. Uh, three, yes, three. Here they are. Do you want me to carry them for you? Yeah, that's right. I'm getting a little rocky. Hey, Joe, take over, will you? Okay. I'll be right back. Let's go, sir. So which cabin is it? Second one on the left. Is this the cabin? Yeah, yeah, I'll look. Hey, open up. Come on, come on, come on, open up. It's me. Come on. Pipe down, will you? Come on, let me in. Where's me? I reckon I'll be getting along, mister. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. See you later, mister. Good night. Yeah, I'll see you later. Operator, operator, get me the police. Chief, listen, this is Bill Raper out at Rock Castle. Yes, Bill? Those two nickel and dime crooks you're looking for, they're here. How do you know? I'm positive, Chief. Every single clue you give me. The, the nickels and dimes, the, the guns, the liquor, everything checks. Did you notice a car? Yes, sir. It's a big, black, new 1940 Buick. Where are they? In a cabin right next door. How many? Three of them, sir. Two men and a girl. That's what I call fine cooperation, Bill. Sit tight and don't say a word to anyone. Mm-hmm. I'll send an emergency squad out there right away. Fifteen minutes later, Colonel, Captain Homer Edmondson with a group of picked men from the Chattanooga Police Force, including Detective Shipley and Carson, met members of the county uniform police under Captain Dyer outside the Rock Castle Roadhouse. The cashier, Bill Raper, was waiting for them. Which cabin are they in, Mr. Raper? That one with the lights on, Captain Edmondson. All right, men. Sussman and Fraser, you stick with me. All right, right. Captain. Now, we'll go to the front of the house. Shipley, you and Carson cover the back with Captain Dyer. You got that? Right, Captain. What's our plan, Captain? Simply to close in and get those bandits. We can't start shooting till we're absolutely sure these are the men we want. But if they show the slightest resistance, open fire with riot guns immediately. Ready? Yes, sir. Let's go. Watch it. They turned out the lights. Better stand back. I'll knock. Open up. Who is it? Police. Just a minute. Hurry it up. All right, coppers. Come and get it. Get back, friend. Just listen, those bullets bounce. All right, men, open up with your riot guns. Right, Captain. Get down low, babe. Those cops are using riot guns. We'll fix them, Jimmy. I'll load your pistols. Roger. Yeah? Cover the back door. I'll cover the front. Okay, Charleston. 
Come on, coppers, try and take it. You'd better give up in there. You're surrounded. We'll give up hot lead. Give me another gap, babe. This one's empty. Hey, I, Jimmy. How is it in the back, Rogers? Can't see him. It's too dark out there. Well, they're all around us, Jimmy. Keep oh. down, babe. Oh. Babe, you hit. Oh, my head. I told you to keep down. <laughs> all right, coppers. You got my gal. I'll show you. Can't get away with that. Charleston. Charleston, there's a copper creeping up in the back. You'll cover the front, Rogers. I'll get that cop. He's coming right up to the back door. What are you going to do, Jimmy? Shut up, babe. I'm running this show. Open your hands, all three of you. I'm waiting for you, cop. Jimmy, you killed him. I'll say I killed him. I got his gun, too. Jimmy, they got Rogers. Lie down on the floor, babe. I'll get him for that. All right, coppers. I got one of you. Who's next? Edmondson. Yes, Fraser. They killed Shipley. Shipley? How? He broke in the back door, shot down before he had a chance. Ah, oh, the dirty dogs. Give me a rat gun, Fraser. Yes, mine's empty. Captain. I'm going after him. Now, wait. Don't go up there. It's probably a trap. There goes one of them out the side door. Stop her, I'll fire. He's running for the woods. I can't see him. There, between those big trees. <laughs> Missed him. It's so dark, I can't see. Oh, we'll never find him in this darkness. What will we do, Captain? He might be hurt. Dyer, you and Carson follow him. I am going to get some bloodhounds. <laughs> What's the matter with the dogs, Captain? Why are they stopping? Too dark for them? I'm afraid they lost the trail, Fraser. What, after we followed that banner for almost eight miles? It's all right, Sussman. Those bloodhounds have told me just what I want to know. Uh, That'll get you, Captain. For the last two miles, the bandit's trail has followed right along these railroad tracks. That's right. But now we've lost it. I can't see what that is. We're headed toward Chattanooga, not away from it. Doesn't that mean anything to you men? You mean you thought maybe the bandit would jump a freight away from Chattanooga? No, Sussman. I thought he'd head for Chattanooga, but I'm, I couldn't be sure. Now I know he's gone back to the city, where we can lay our hands on him. With one of the nickel and dime bandits, Joe Rogers, dead, Colonel, and the bandit's girlfriend in a prison hospital, the Chattanooga police combed the city for the remaining bandit, now definitely identified as James Charlson. Later that night, after visiting hundreds of rooming houses, two police officers, Patrolman Fraser and Sussman, climbed the stairs of a cheap rooming house an hour after midnight. What number did the landlady say, Fraser? Room six. Yeah. It's room number six, right up there at the head of the stairs. Yeah. Landlady said her new boarder arrived an hour ago. Have your gun ready. But I will, Sussman. Turn on your flashlight. I'll try the door. Right. The door's unlocked. That's lucky. Careful now. Easy, easy. There, he's in bed. Sound asleep. Wonder if he's a guy won't. He's pretty young for a bandit. Let's make sure, Sussman. Pull down the covers. A pistol there in his right hand. And another one next to him. He's starting to wake up. Grab him. I'm with you. Look on him. I didn't do nothing. I got him, Fraser. Put the braces on him. Charlton, you're all through. You come to crazy. I'm not the guy you want. No. General Wright, Fraser. I... Let's see those two guns. That don't prove nothing, Cobbler. I didn't kill nobody. I like guns. See, I collect them. Yeah? Well, this is one gun you never should have collected, Charlton. It's the gun you took from Detective Shipley after you killed him. And it's the last gun you're ever going to collect. And so, Colonel Schwartzko, through splendid police work and excellent citizen cooperation, the criminal activities of James Charlson came to an abrupt end. Placed on trial in my court for robbery and murder on February 27th, 1940, he was quickly found guilty. I sentenced him to life imprisonment in the Tennessee State Penitentiary. He's there at this very moment. And what happened to the girl who was with Charleston and Rogers, Judge Miller? For months, she hovered between life and death with a bullet touching her brain. 
Doctor said her mental faculties would be impaired indefinitely, and under the circumstances, she was freed in the custody of her parents. Thank you, Judge Miller, for a fine case. I'm particularly pleased with the way you brought out the great value of public cooperation with the authorities. When the police thus frankly solicit help from our law-abiding citizens, and those citizens promptly and comprehensively cooperate, no criminal can escape. Every time the police and the people work together, the end is inevitable. Crime does not pay. And now, the clues. Special bulletin, all citizens. Watch for murderer, 24, 5 feet 5 inches, 135 pounds, dark brown hair slicked back, brown eyes. This man with tall, sandy-haired companion, having wrinkled face, wanted for brutal murder several days ago, refrigeration engineer near San Antonio, Texas, may be traveling in black Ford station wagon, and may have in possession a 44 caliber Smith & Wesson revolver with cedar handle. Warning, citizens of Pennsylvania, be on lookout for man 28, 5 feet 8 inches, 160 pounds, brown hair, gray eyes, occupation farmer. This man wanted in connection with feud slaying last week. Indian Head section of Fayette County, Pennsylvania. If you have any information concerning these clues, notify your local police, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, or gangbusters at once. For Sloan's Liniment next week, the case of the missing corpse. Here reenacted for the first time the inside factual account of one of the most fantastic cases in all criminology. Learn how a dead man faced his murderer. Sloan's Liniment brings you one of Philip H. Lord's most astounding dramatizations in America's Crusade Against Crime. to you, the men and women of America, by the makers of Sloan's Liniment. With the cooperation of leading law enforcement officials of the United States, Gangbusters presents facts in the relentless war of the police on the underworld. Authentic case histories that show the never-ending activity of the police in their work of protecting our citizens. America's crusade against crime. You too can help in our crusade. Here's a last-minute police bulletin. Nationwide alarm. Attention all citizens. Watch for Clifford Davidson, 32, 5 feet 7 inches, 208 pounds, brown hair, blue eyes. This man, veteran criminal and escape artist, broke from jail, we woke up, Oklahoma last week, where he is awaiting trial for murder, allegedly committed following a previous escape from prison. Caution, this man is dangerous. Gangbusters urges you to be on the alert for this criminal. We will have more clues for you at the end of our program. In a moment... We'll be ready for our proxy interview between Colonel H. Norman Schwarzkopf and prosecuting attorney Stanley Wallach of St. Louis County, Missouri, who will discuss the strange case of the missing corpse in which a dead man convicted his murderer. But first, April showers, they say, bring May flowers, but they also bring the muscular aches and pains that often go with damp and windy weather. Yet there's no need for any member of your family to suffer the discomfort of a stiff neck or sore back just so long as you have that handy bottle of dependable Sloan's liniment on your medicine shelf. Here's Sloan's 1-2 heat treatment that has brought such quick and comforting relief to millions. One, pat on some Sloan's liniment. Two, relax for a few minutes. Then, like a heat treatment, Sloan's glowing warmth goes to work on that tight and painful spot. 
In almost no time at all, Sloan's will help soothe your pain away. You'll find Sloan's quick action is a welcome friend, whatever the cause of your muscular distress. Accident, overexertion, or exposure to raw and biting weather. Ask your druggist for Sloan's liniment if you need a fresh supply after the last few wintry months. Sloan's costs so little, and you're so grateful for its soothing help when you want relief in a hurry. Now for our proxy interview between Colonel Schwarzkopf and Prosecuting Attorney Stanley Wallach of St. Louis County, Missouri. Picture our setting as a special office turned over to gangbusters by Commissioner Louis J. Valentine of the New York City Police. Colonel Schwarzkopf. The case of the missing corpse. Prosecutor Wallet, that sounds almost like fiction. Tonight's case may appear fantastic, Colonel Schwarzkopf, but it is a matter of public record. This case concerns Alma Dowling and Izzy Londi, two crafty criminals whose viciousness has seldom been matched by any criminals anywhere. We begin in St. Louis one late afternoon in February 1938 in the hideout apartment maintained by Alma Dowling. Drink up, Landy. Thanks, darling. I asked you up here to explain what I got in mind for you. What do you mean? I'm considering you as trigger man for my outfit. Trigger man, huh? Yeah. Next thing I consider is what's your experience. I got plenty. I got it all right here on my desk. Here on this case history card. Here's Elandi, known as Monkey Ears. Robberies and other jobs, market prison 10 to 20 years. Shot way out of jail, handy with guns. How did you find out all that, darling? That's my business, to find things out and to get things done. Why should I join your mob, huh? Listen, Landy, when I want a man in my mob, he joins. But I've been away for 13 years. I've been out of things. I'll teach you the ropes. Then you'll be a big asset to my protective organization. Protective organization? Yeah. The businessmen and storekeepers. They pay us so much dough per week for protection. <laughs> protection from our own gang. <laughs> but suppose the storekeepers squawk to the cops. They know better than that. It's cheaper to pay up and shut up than to stop a bullet or get crippled for life. Yes. Yeah. Sounds okay to me, darling. Blondie, before we're through, we'll have every store in the city in our protective organization. They're going to pay us, and they're going to pay plenty. Good morning, mister. You remember me? What are you men back here again for? Hey, listen, mister, this is your last chance. Are you joining our protective organization or anything? No, I'm not. Okay, boys. Dump that paint all over the place. Give them the work. Right, right. Okay. No, stop it. Don't, please. Don't. Yeah, we're going to teach you a lesson, mister. And if you ever blab to the cops, you'll never see your wife or kids again. Go to it, boys. Don't answer that phone, buddy. My business comes first. You got the money for the organization? I tell you, I can't pay you. I'm not taking enough money in my store. You plan to welch on the organization, huh? And I'll show you. What are you going to do? You know what's in this can? Oh. Acid. Oh, don't. It's all yours, mister. Right in your face. Oh, but I... That's the dry cleaning store on the corner, Red. The one Dowling wants us to take care of. I got the dynamite already, Londy. All right, drive by the store and I'll light the fuse and heat it. Hey, Londy, there's a guy down the block. Don't worry about the guy down the block. I'll light the fuse. There! Step on it, Red! Explosion in dry cleaning store at Franklin and Jefferson Avenues at 10 p.m. Investigate immediately. Repeating. Explosion in dry cleaning store, Franklin and Jefferson Avenues. An hour later, Colonel, at headquarters. We got that report, Moore? Yes, Captain. The emergency squad say dynamite was used to blow up that dry cleaning store. Moore, we can be pretty certain who's back of this outbreak of violence. Racketeers extorting money from businessmen. It's an ugly situation, Captain. We can't get witnesses to testify against these crooks. Yes, crooks like Elmer Dowling. Uh, we've got another bombing on our hands. And still no witness. I'm assigning additional squads of plainclothes ones to cover various business places and stores. And... Yes? Captain, there's a man out here by the name of Louis Lee Baker. He wants to see you. What about? 
He says it's about the bombing of that dry cleaning store tonight. The bombing? Send him right in. Yes, Captain. Right away, sir. Paul, open the door. Yes, sir. Right in, sir. The captain will see you. Thank you, officer. I do, Captain. My name is Baker. Glad to see you, Mr. Baker. Have a chair. Thank you. You say you know something about this bombing tonight? Well, I don't know if this means anything, Captain, but I thought I ought to report it anyway. Report what, sir? Well, at uh, 10 o'clock, I was walking along Franklin Avenue. Yes. And just as I was about to cross the street, a car came racing down the avenue. What happened? Well, there was an explosion. I, I didn't know then it was a bomb. Later, I got thinking about it, and the bomb and the speeding car. Uh, what kind of a car was it? It was a Chrysler sedan. I didn't see the license number, but I did get a good look at one of the men in the car. Oh, is that so? Uh, he was uh, sort of pasty looking. Had very black eyebrows and big lips. Anything else? Well, the one thing I noticed most of all were his ears. His ears? Yes, sir. Stuck way out. What's that? Well, uh, I never saw a man whose ears stuck out so much. Sir. Was he stockly built? Well, yeah, yes, he was. This means something to you, more? I'm not sure yet, Captain. But I used to know a criminal who fitted that general description to a T. Monkey ears, they called him. If it's the same man, he's a gunman of the worst type. All right. We'll have Mr. Baker go through the identification files. If he can pick out the picture of the same criminal you have in mind, we'll have our first positive identification to help smash this gang. And the picture that Lewis Lee Baker identified, Colonel, was the picture of monkey ears. Is he Lundy? The authorities moved fast and arrested him in a few hours. Who good police work, Prosecutor Wallach. Indicted for this bombing, Londy posted bail and was released by the courts pending trial. He immediately phoned Dowling. Yeah, Dowling, that's why I'm calling you. That Baker guy's identified me for the bombing of that dry cleaning store. I'll go to jail. Hold it, Londy. Where are you calling from? From the truck store. I'm afraid to come near you. The cops are on my trail. Yeah, I thought so. Now, let me think. This is serious, Dowling. You've got to help me. Yeah, I know how serious it is. Once the cops throw you in jail, they'll probably get more information that'll lead to me. You? I'm the guy that's in a jam. Don't think of the spot I'm in. Hey, wait a minute. What did you say is the name of the guy who saw the bombing? Baker. Lewis Lee Baker. Baker, eh? Is he the only witness the cops got? Yes. You sure of that? Positive. Good. What do you mean, good? If something should happen to this witness, the cops wouldn't have no case, would they? That's right, Tally. Well, something is going to happen to him. We're going to find this guy, Baker. And when we do, he won't be a witness. He'll be a corpse. Meanwhile, Colonel, at headquarters, the captain was talking with Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker, your identification of Izzy Lomby as the cleaning store bomber is the first good break we've had in our campaign to rid this city of racketeers. I'm glad I'm able to help, Captain. You realize, Mr. Baker, that your life is in constant danger. Yes, sir. That gang will stop at nothing, absolutely nothing, to prevent you from testifying at Londy's trial. So we're going to hide you on a little farm near Sykeston, Missouri. You know where that is? Uh, yes, sir, about 150 miles south of here. Yes. Under no circumstances are you to leave the farm unless accompanied by our men. I understand, Captain. When we want you, our men will show their credentials and will tell you the captain wants to see you. Now remember that phrase. The captain wants to see you. Yes, sir. The captain wants to see you. Mr. Baker was taken to this farm, Colonel, and given ample police protection. Then a startling event occurred. Prosecutor Wallach, we're anxious to hear this startling occurrence, but right now, here's Charles Stark with a few words. Mowing the lawn for the first time after the long winter months is always a chore. The ground is uneven, the grass is tough, and you yourself are probably more than a bit tired and sore when you're finished. That's when you need Sloan's 1-2 heat treatment to bring you quick and comforting relief for muscular aches and pains. Here's all you have to do. One, take your bottle of reliable Sloan's from your medicine shelf and pat on some of this quick-acting liniment. Two, relax. And then, like a heat treatment, Sloan's helps ease those stiff and aching muscles. You can actually feel that penetrating, glowing warmth easing away your pain. Sloan's liniment has helped millions in just this quick and easy way during the past 50 years. And Sloan's will probably do you the same good turn. You'll find Sloan's liniment a true family friend in need. Welcome to the members of your family all through the year. For whatever the cause of your muscular distress... 
accident, overexertion, or exposure to chilling drafts, you'll find that Sloan's will help you forget your aches and pains in almost no time at all. So make sure you always have a bottle of Sloan's on your medicine shelf. Ask your druggist tomorrow for Sloan's liniment. Now back to Colonel Schwarzkopf. Prosecutor Wallace, with Mr. Baker hidden out on a farm near Sykeston, Missouri, and with Elmer Dowling threatening to kill Baker to prevent his testifying at Izzy Londy's trial, you said a startling event occurred. Baker stayed close to the farm, Colonel Schwarzkopf, awaiting word that the captain wanted to see him. Then, one week later, Baker was standing at the farm entrance when two men drove up and got out of their car. Oh, Baker. Mr. Baker. Uh, yes, sir. You gentlemen want to see me? Ah, uh, yes, Mr. Baker. We're detectives from headquarters. Detectives? See our badges? The captain sent us out. He wants to see you right away. About that uh, farming. The captain wants to see you. Now, if you'll just get in the car. But, uh, I'd like to leave word with the men at the farmhouse where I'm oh, going. We haven't so got the... time for that. This is urgent, Mr. Baker. We don't want to keep the captain waiting. Well, you know best, sir. Sit right here in the front seat. Thank you. Right between the two of us. You don't know what the captain wants to see me about, do you? I'm not sure. But I think it has something to do with murder. <laughs> Gentlemen, we've been driving for an hour. It's getting dark. We're going in the wrong direction. This isn't the way to town. Baker. Yes, sir? We are not going to town. What? The captain is going to meet us at a house with a big night road. Oh. Why didn't you tell me about this before? We got our order. Here's the place now. Uh, that house looks deserted. There's no light. Don't worry about that, Baker. Well, where's the captain's car if he's going to meet us out here? Yes, we're the way. How about it? I guess we are. Let's go in the house anyway. Yes, sure. Come on, Baker. Right. I'd rather wait here in the car. No, Baker. We're going inside. Come on, Baker. Orders are orders. All right. Uh, I'll do what two men say. Quiet around here. Ain't it, Baker? Yeah. Yeah, it is. Let me take your arm, Baker. Take my arm. Yeah, it's so dark in here. Stumble. You're. You sure the captain will be here? Step inside, Baker. It's so dark in here, I can't see. Turn on your flashlight now. Sure. Go on inside, Baker. Hey. There, there's no one in this house. It's, it's empty. Deserted. That's right, Baker. That's why we brought you here. So what do you mean? Just this. Wait. I want to make sure. Now well, we got nothing to worry about, Red. Two bullets right through his head. Let's go. Yeah. Yeah, let's go. Darling, do you think anybody could have heard those shots? Nah. No one lives in the miles of this place. Let's get in the car and strap. Hey, Red. Wait a minute. What's the matter? We ought to get rid of that body. Not me. I ain't going back to touch no corpse. Red. Unless you want the same thing Baker got. You better come with me. Okay, no. But I don't like it. Yes. Quite quiet around here, ain't it? And dark. Good spot for a job like this. Flash your light. Darling, look. Say, what the... The corpse, the body. It's gone. But it can't be. It was right here on the floor a minute ago. Flash a light around. The room is empty. But he was dead. I killed him. Two bullets right through his head. Then where is he? A dead man can't get up and walk away. I'm getting out of here. Now, me too. Ask you to wallet. You mean to say the corpse, the victim's body, was actually gone? Yes, Colonel. By a strange miracle of fate, Lewis Lee Baker had not been killed. Though suffering intense agony, he had managed to crawl out the back door of the deserted house and hide. 
He saw the two gunmen return and then run off in terror when they found that his supposedly dead body had vanished. So that's why the corpse was missing. What did Mr. Baker do? He dragged himself to the side of the road where some passing workmen found him and rushed him to a hospital. Later that night at the hospital, Baker talked with police officers. That's the whole story, Captain. They shot me twice in my head. But I guess I'm too tough to kill. I don't feel I ought to question you any further, Mr. Baker. You need rest. I, I want to tell you all I know. All right, Ma, take this down. Yes, Captain. The man who shot me was a big fella, six feet, about 200 pounds. Yes. Blonde hair, blue eyes. Now, take it easy, Mr. Baker. I had a broken nose, no chin. No chin. Big fellow, blonde, blue eyes, broken nose, receding chin. Why, Captain, that description fits the man we arrested on suspicion but couldn't hold. Yes, Elmer Dowling. Captain, you know the man? The man who tried to kill me. Yes, Mr. Baker, and we're going to get him. When you do, I'll be in court to testify. Yes, sure. All right, now relax and get some sleep. Yes, sir. You need every bit of strength you've got. Yes, Captain. Come on, boy, we've got work to do. That fellow Baker has more courage than a dozen men, Captain. He certainly has more. Two things I can't understand. How Dowling found Baker at the farm, and why should Dowling want to kill him? Uh, seems you can't hide anything from that gang. They probably followed every move Baker made. But I know why Dowling wanted to kill him. Baker's our only witness against Izzy Londy. If Baker had been killed, Londy would have gone free. Then you think Londy and Dowling are part of the same mob, eh? It points that way. Yes, it does. More, I want you to grab Izzy Londy and throw him back in jail immediately. This time, he's got to stay in jail till he goes on trial. Right, Captain. Meanwhile, I'll get to work on Dowling. We're going to put the heat on every member of that gang until we get Dowling or they turn him over to us. Within five hours, Colonel, the police had again arrested Izzy Londy, and the search for Dowling was on. Warnings was flashed from coast to coast. Attention, all field agents. Federal Bureau Investigation. Attempt to locate and hold for questioning Elmer Dowling in connection with attempted murder. Dowling is six feet tall. Urgent. Police of Eastern Seaboard. Arrest on site Elmer Dowling, fugitive. Dowling weighs 200 pounds. Special notice, West Coast Police. Elmer Dowling reported in California. Wanted for attempted murder. Dowling has blonde hair. Attention, all Missouri police. Be on watch for Elmer Dowling, fugitive gangster, now at large. Dowling, believed to have returned to St. Louis, may be hiding out somewhere in the city. Dowling. Dowling. That's you, Red. Yeah. Open up. Why'd you come here? Look at this newspaper. It's about Izzy Londy. Bundy, he was sentenced for that bombing today. Got 25 years. 25 years? The guy who sent him to jail was that fellow you tried to kill, Baker. He testified in court against Londy. That was the mistake of my life. Not making sure that guy Baker was dead. Now look what he's done. Has me hounded like a rat. The cops sure are rats here, darling. I can't stand much more of this. Cooped up in four walls, afraid to show my nose outside. Afraid every noise I hear on the stairs of the cops. I'm going nuts. I can't sleep no more. I lie in the bed, hour after hour, just listening and waiting. That's all you can do, darling. If you show up on the streets, the cops will grab you inside of ten minutes. So where's the rest of the gang? Why don't they do something for yeah, me? Hiding out from the cops, same as you. Well, where's Jaime? You ought to be able to find Jaime. Yeah, he must be with the others. Oh, the yellow rat. Just when I need him, they run out of me. If I ever get my hands on him, I'll... Hold it, Red. Don't open that door. I'll wait till I get my gun. That ain't the door, it's the phone. What? Oh. oh, yeah. Yeah. Hello, darling. Uh, who's this? Me, Jaime. Oh, Jaime. Well, where have you been? You got no idea how glad I am to hear you. Now, listen, Jaime. I'm on a spot, see? I need dough to beat town. Tell me where Rick can meet you so you can go and... Listen, something. you dumb cluck. Dumb cluck, why, I'll break you. Now, now, wait a minute. What's the matter? Plenty. Now, what do you mean? The cops got the gang smashed. Half the boys are in jail already. And the cops ain't gonna stop till they get you and every one of us. Yeah, well... So there's only one thing for you to do. For me to do? The boys say for you to give up to the cops tonight. What? Are you crazy? You've had your morning, darling. We'll be watching you. Yeah, now, wait, Jaime, wait, wait. Now, remember, darling, it's the cops or us. Hello. Hello. 
Hello. What is it, darling? The gang. They're throwing me over. Put me on the spot. On the spot? Yeah. But how did they know where I was? No one knew where I was, but... What are you looking at me like that? For? You. You were the only one who knew. You're in with them. No. Darling, put on that gun. Shut up. I'll hand over your money. Oh, sure. Sure, darling. Here. Here is every, every cent I got. I ain't licked yet. I'll get out of this town. And I'll kill anybody that tries to stop sure, me. Sure, you will. Sure. Now, Red, it's your turn. Don't, don't shoot. Please. Don't. I ain't shooting. I need these bullets for the cops. But here's, here's what you're getting off, man. Don't, 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 don't. Hello, headquarters. Listen, copper. You want Elmer Downing. I know where you'll get him. Who is this? Never mind who it is. Oh, just his call. Right. Me. Go out to the waiting room of the Taylor Avenue car station, and you'll find Downing if you get there fast enough. Hey. Maury, hung up. What was it, Another tip on Dolly. Get a special squad. We're going out to the Taylor Avenue car station. It may be a false alarm, but we're going to investigate at once. All right, Maury, pull up here. There's the car station. Right, Captain. We'll leave the car here so Dolly won't see it. Follow me, men. Yes, sir. Any special instructions, Captain? If Dowling is in this waiting room, we've got to be careful. He's sure to be armed. And I don't want any innocent person hurt. Yes. We'll have our guns ready. I'll know Dowling the second I see him. Here's the waiting room. Careful now, men. A lot of people in there, Captain. See that big fellow sitting there hiding back at that newspaper? It's Dowling. I wonder if he sees us. He's getting up. Now hold it, men. He doesn't want any shooting. Going out the back way. Good. You two men guard this front door. Yes, Captain. Oh, you're going to have to round back. Come on, fast. Right, Captain. You ready to shoot, Annie? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Hold it. There he goes. Back of that house. Oh, you wait here. I'll cut around this side and try to head him off. I'll put your hands, come on. Darling. Now, I'll kill you if you don't do what I say. I'm using you with a shield. Start walking. All right. Oh, I'll kill you. I've got that gun, darling. Oh. 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 It's okay. Let go of my arm. Let me get that gun, I said. He's not down. Are you all right, Captain? Yes, Mar, I'm all right. But this rat isn't. Put the handcuffs on him. There's a man waiting at headquarters to see you, darling. What man? A man you tried to murder. A missing corpse. Helmut Darling was positively identified by Lewis Lee Baker, Colonel, and went on trial for the attempted murder of Mr. Baker on March 4th, 1940. He was convicted and was sentenced to 30 years in the state penitentiary at Jefferson, Missouri. This has been a most interesting case, Prosecutor Wallace, and I want to congratulate you on your successful prosecution of Dowling. One of the most impressive features of this case is the fine courage displayed by Mr. Baker who refused to be intimidated in his efforts to help the police smash this mob. In these days of national stress, America needs citizens who support the law enforcement authorities and who are not afraid to face the gangsters and reveal them as real enemies whom this country must face. Thank you, Prosecutor Wallace, for helping us to prove again that crime does not pay. Now, before we broadcast our nationwide clues, a few words from Charles Stark. I should like to leave you with a reminder. Muscular aches and pains often arrive without warning or invitation. During the summer months to come, when we are all more active, take the wise precaution of always having a bottle of dependable Sloan's liniment on hand. You'll discover that Sloan's will help you get the quick and comforting relief you want. One, pat on some Sloan's liniment. That's all. Just pat it on. Two, relax. And soon you'll feel that welcome, gentle warmth as it penetrates right to your sore and stiff muscles, easing and soothing the pain. Ask for Sloan's liniment when next you visit your favorite druggist. And now, the clues. Attention, citizen Southwest. Look out for man wanted concerning murder. Negro, 33, 5 feet 7 inches, 135 pounds, black pinky hair, brown eyes, left eye punctured and may be completely out. Three razor slash scars, left arm at shoulder, may wear dark glasses to conceal defective eye. This man wanted connection murder near Muskogee, Oklahoma. <coughs> Caution, citizens New England, New York, New Jersey. Watch for James Joseph Horan, 39, 5 feet 9 inches, 
180 pounds, brown hair turning gray, brown eyes, tattoo initial JJH, right forearm, large ears, eyes slightly crossed. This man, veteran robber who has been operating in New York and New Jersey, wanted by federal authorities for questioning concerning robbery of bank at Suffield, Connecticut. <laughs> If you have any information concerning these clues, notify your local police, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, or gangbusters at once. Tonight's broadcast is the last of the current season for Sloan's Liniment. But we have some glad news. Sloan's will again sponsor gangbusters in the fall. Until then, we wish to thank all of you who have sent us so many splendid letters. And we want to thank the police organizations of the country for cooperating with the producers of gangbusters in proving so conclusively that crime does not pay. And speaking for Sloan's, a very happy summer to you all until we meet again in the fall. America's crusade against crime. <laughs> This is the National Broadcasting Company. Gangbusters, brought to you by the makers of Sloan's Liniment. Calling the police, calling the G-men, calling all Americans to war on the underworld. Tonight, the case of the Black Bottom Bandit, the gay young southern killer who used two weapons... A machine gun and a clarinet. But before we begin tonight's case, let's consider the cases of all you folks who find that March dampness almost always plagues you with muscular aches and pains. Well, there's no need for you to endure the discomfort of a stiff neck or a sore shoulder. Just reach for your bottle of Sloan's liniment and enjoy the same quick and comforting relief that Sloan's has brought to thousands during the past 50 years. You'll find Sloan's the easiest of liniments to apply. All you have to do is pat on Sloan's liniment, that's all. Pat Sloan's on the sore place and relax. In practically no time at all, you'll feel a gentle and beneficial warmth. The sign that Sloan's liniment is going to work just like a heat treatment to loosen your tight and aching muscles. Because Sloan's liniment brings you this relief, the relief you want. You should have a bottle of this reliable friend in need on your medicine shelf at all times. For muscular distress often strikes without warning. And the faster you apply Sloan's liniment, the sooner you'll be your old self once again. So tonight, after our thrilling gangbuster dramatization, take a look at your medicine shelf. If you see that your bottle of Sloan's is almost empty, be sure to stop in at your druggist's for Sloan's liniment first thing tomorrow. Now picture our setting as a special office turned over to gangbusters by Commissioner Louis J. Valentine of the New York City Police. Colonel H. Norman Schwarzkopf, now serving with the United States Army, Interviews by proxy, Superintendent George Rayer of the New Orleans Police Department. Colonel Schwarzkopf. Superintendent Rayer, you say that music and dancing played an important part in tonight's case? A very important part, Colonel Schwarzkopf. That's what I want out of life. Music, dancing. To have a hundred girls falling on my neck. Hear them call me the big shot. All I need is the money. And I'll get that with this. Yes, Colonel, in an effort to be considered a big shot, Earl Joyner turned gunman, but was captured. Then on May 13th, 1932, he shot one of the prison guards and escaped with two other convicts. They fled to Texas, where Earl Joyner set up headquarters in a house on the outskirts of Houston. Got it, will you, Joyner? Playing that same thing over and over again. Yeah, lay off, Joyner. Give it a willies. You guys don't appreciate hot music. I'd appreciate some of that money you said we was going to make. Me too. Well, what do you think I've been doing the past three weeks? 
I got plans all drawn up and plotted out. I got the blueprints of the inside of every bank within a hundred miles. How about going into action? Right, put the kid and join their layoff at Clarinet and talk with it, will you? Okay. To lead the kind of life I want, boys. Nightclubs, baby dolls, expensive clothes. You gotta have money. But we're not going after chicken feed. We're going after the stuff. Now, pull your chairs up the table and I'll lay the plans out and show you stuff. I got every detail worked out. Now, take a look at these drawings. Ah, say. Say, this is something. Yeah. Yeah, I knew you had brains, Joyner, but I didn't know you had this many. Huh. I'm going to explain those plans to you in just a minute. But first, here's the basis of my planning. Yeah. We're going to have machine guns and we're going to use them. We're going to mow people down. We aren't going to stop and tell people to get out of the way. We're going to shoot them out of the way. All right, now, look at these plans. Bank after bank, we're going to take. And we're going to take them over with machine gun bullets. We'll shoot up the bank so they won't even know what we look like. Emergency. Bank robbery at First National Bank, Springs, Texas. Three gunmen armed with machine guns... Shut up, bank, as they fled. Urgent. A la Louisiana bank robbed of over $6,000. Warning. Criminals have machine guns. All police. Merchants and Farmers Bank. Grapeland, Texas. Raided by machine gun bandits. This sure is a life. Plenty of dough and one nightclub after another. Yeah, boy. <laughs> Look at Blondie over there, Jordan. <laughs> Look at Blondie. Yeah. Oh, she's swinging out. The crest of the waves, boys. We're riding the crest of the waves. Hey, what's the matter? No music. Oh, we got to have music. Hey, leader. Uh, band leader. Band leader, come here. Yes, sir. You want me? Yeah. I want you to play Black Bottom. It's my favorite song. But we just played that a few minutes ago. It's all right. I'm paying, ain't it? Here's a hundred bucks. Oh, thank you, sir. Now, just a second. Here's another hundred. Oh, thanks. You're talking to a big shot now. Go on, play the black bottom and play it hot. Yes, yes sir. I'll play that number right away, sir. All right, boys. The black bottom and give it everything you got. <laughs> Now, Joyner, I think we've shot up more banks in a shorter time than any gang that ever operated. We ought to get a good haul from this bank and find <laughs> Tula. <laughs> How's it feel to have a rope tied around your neck, Mr. Bank President? <laughs> he doesn't look much like a bank president now, does he? Oh, it's the biggest stunt you ever pulled, Joyner. Kidnapping this guy from his house to make him open the bank vault. But you better loosen that rope a bit. You don't want the guy to croak on us before we get to the bank. <laughs> <laughs> hey, which road do I take, Joyner? Out to the left. The bank's up the street to the left, sir. Okay. Well, for Pete's sake. And hey, what is this? All these wagons and stuff. Pull up, pull up. Oh, girl. Howdy, dear. How's the prop coming? Back up, girl. Back up, there, girl. Here, come on. Here, Must be market day. Yeah, and the sap farmer's got the whole road blocked for the horses and wagons. They're all around the bank, too. They'd spot us in a second if we try to go in. Well, it looks like the job's off. A couple of those farmers are looking this way. They may spot this bank president in the car and know something's wrong. We better get out of here. Turn up the side road fast. That's what I call a rotten break. Yeah, now we can't use this bank president. What are we going to do with him? Chuck him out. He may go to the cops. He's got a wife and kids. If he puts the cops on our trail, we'll come back and kill him. You hear that, mister? Y yes. Okay, get out. I, I can't. 
If you slow down... Slow I... down nothing. Jump. Then I'll be killed. Oh, you don't want to jump. Oh, well, I'll kick you. You have to slow down first, please. We're going 60. Oh, oh, oh you get hurt, the better I like it. Oh. Come on, fellas, kick him out. Ah. Ah. <laughs> See him go flying? Yeah, it bounced for 20 yards. Well, where to now, Joyner? I don't know. I... Hey, wait. There's one town I haven't seen yet. New Orleans. That's right. They say they got some swell dance halls down there. Yeah, and Creole babes. That's where we'll head, Davis. New Orleans, the land of dreams. We'll bust it wide open. <laughs> Look out! Open fire, man. Pass! You imagine they sideswept our car without crashing? Any of your cars and after them. Come on. Come on. Come on. Step on it. They're getting away. Turn on that searchlight. They got around that bend in the road. Look. Looks like a trail of gasoline in the center of the road. We must have plugged their gas tank. Can't get far. They can't get off this road. Swamps on both sides. Faster, faster. Hold it. Car up ahead. It stopped. Pull up to it. But we set to shoot. It's the bandit car. There are the bullet holes. Car is empty. Flash that searchlight around. Right, Sheriff. Don't see anything. Wait. Turn the light back to the left a bit. Yeah? Those cypress trees, the other side of the canal. By George, there they are, climbing up the other side of the canal. There they are. Get them. Too late. They got to wait through the tree. Pete. Yes, Sheriff. Face to the nearest phone. Have men approach that area from the other side of the swamp. Yes, sir. The rest of you come with me. We're going to swim this canal after. Right, sir. Right, yes, I go. Certainly exciting action, Superintendent Rayer. But before you tell us the outcome of this chase, Frank Gallup has a word from our sponsor. night, freight trains and motor trucks are crisscrossing this country, freighting the materials of war to the men of the services. The men who handle these tough jobs deserve the thanks of the nation. With all the rest of you who are in important jobs, they've taken a pledge that now work comes first. That means staying in good health so that you can do a good job. I guess that's why so many thousands on thousands of you now keep a bottle of reliable Sloan's liniment in your locker at the plant, as well as another bottle on your medicine shelf at home. Or you've learned from bitter experience that muscular aches and pains often strike suddenly, especially when you're on a strenuous and tiring job. Sloan's, you'll learn, takes hardly any time at all to apply. During your lunchtime or after work, all you have to do is pat on some Sloan's liniment and then relax for a short while. Sloan's does the rest, working like a heat treatment to help you find the quick and comforting relief you want so much. In many jobs, you're liable to suffer muscular distress from all three of the main causes. Overexertion, accident, or overexposure to chilling weather. Sloan's a real friend in need. Will help loosen and relax your sore and aching muscles, whatever the cause. Remember that when you use Sloan's liniment, you needn't endure hard and painful rubbing or massage. All you do is pat on this world-famous liniment. Just pat Sloan's on the sore place and relax. If you've never used Sloan's Liniment, you'd do well to stop in at your favorite druggist on your way home from work tomorrow and get a bottle. If you're one of the millions of Sloan's regular users, always be sure you have a fairly full bottle. An empty bottle of Sloan's is no help at all when you want relief in a hurry. Now back to our interview at headquarters. Now, Superintendent Ryer, did Earl Joyner and his gang escape the posse that waylaid them in the swamps? Yes, Colonel Schwarzkopf, they did escape. And they seemed to disappear off the face of the map. Three weeks later, Chief Grosh of the New Orleans Police and his Lieutenant Schwem were covering the nightclubs of New Orleans. It's after two in the morning, Chief Grosh. Don't you think we ought to call it a night? Oh, I guess so, Lieutenant Schwem. Perhaps we are on a wild goose chase. Yeah. But I want to get that killer, Joyner. 
We've been covering every New Orleans nightclub for weeks now. If Jonah was here, we'd run into him before this. Yeah, but nightclubs and girls and hot music are his weakness. Which, Wim? There's the Kit Kat Club up the street. We haven't covered that for a couple of hours. I've never seen anybody so persistent as you are, Chief Grosh. You got on a trail of someone. Joyner is a maniac with a gun. His whole gang is. Oh, well. We can give the place the once over from this door. Quite a crowd inside. Yeah. But no sign. Lieutenant. Yes, Chief. That table in the far corner. Those men sitting at it. Davis. And Morgan. But I, I don't see Joyner. No, no, I don't either. Problem is, how are we going to approach that table without them spotting us? They'll have guns. They ever start shooting at all these people inside? Yeah, it'll be a wholesale murder. But look, I got an idea. What, Chief? Here's a couple of waiters' aprons. We'll put these on. Hey, that's a swell idea. Yeah. Come on, tie this string in back of me. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, think we ought to carry a tray or something? No, these aprons should do the trick. Uh, I'm all set. Now remember, Schwem, we've got to grab them before they can pull a gun. Yeah. If they spot us before we grab them, jump for the table. Right. Knock it over on top of them. And pull the tablecloth over the head. Right. All right. Through this door. Now, not too fast, Schwim. Not too fast. Right. If they spot us, die for the table. Morgan, looking this way. Yeah. Keep walking. A few more steps and... He sees us. Die for them, fast. Right. Drop it. Drop that gun. Okay, okay, don't shoot. I give up. Put cuffs on him, Lieutenant. All right. Gosh, that fellow dancing for that exit. It's Joyner. Hold these fellas. I'll go get him. Joyner, look out, cops! No, you don't, Joyner. Come here. Let go of me. Let go of me. Want to put up a fight, eh? No, no, I give up. I give up. Bet your life you do. Come on, Joyner. Start walking. Your dancing days are over. Colonel Schwarzkopf, Joyner and his gang were sentenced from 27 to 46 years in Angola prison. But less than a year later, September 10th, 1933. They got them put away for life, but they're wrong. They've built up a new gang right here inside the prison. Some of the worst killers in the country. <laughs> Wouldn't want to meet us up a dark alley, would you? Well, you will. We're getting out today during the ball game. We got guns, and we're getting out during the fall. Okay, boys, now's the time. Shoot in the crowd. Kill him, kill him. Wait for the front gate. Come on. Here's a guy. Shoot him. Back in the building. Visitor running this way. Plug him. Don't wait. Plug him. Okay, hold it. Yeah? Well, what is it, Joyner? The captain of the guard should be at the front gate. He'll have the keys. There he is. He don't see us. Kill him. That got him. We'll grab the keys and get out of here. Come on, fast. Statewide alarm. Emergency. Thirteen convicts led by Earl Joyner have shot way out of prison. Three men killed, including captain of guards. Killers are heading north. Black all roads and form posses. Special bulletin to all posses. Eight of escaped convicts were surrounded and captured after gun battle near Rolling Creek. One convict killed. This accounts for eight of the 13 who escaped. Sarah's posse reporting. Four more convicts have just been recaptured. When they wrecked car near White's Gully, they are now on their way back to jail. To all buses in the field, Earl Joyner, only convict at large, has escaped into wooded swamp on outskirts of Houston. All buses close in. Ah, cops, after me. But only stop raining so I can see something. It's so dark. 
got to find some place to hide till morning. Oh! Oh! Oh, my face! Bob wire fence! Oh! Oh, I'm all cut. I'm bloody. Keep going, man. You went this way. Keep going. Right after me. Which way to turn? Gotta find some place to hide. What's that? Pigs. A pig pen. Maybe I can hide in there. Out of my way, you rotten pigs. If I can bury myself in the muck of this pig pen. Ooh, my face. Come on, man. Try to get far away. That's right, Sheriff. Get her in here. Flash the lights around. Listen to the pigs. Wonder what they're so excited about. Probably the storm. Turn your light on. Yeah, I guess so. It looks like a barn over there. Might be in that barn. Come on. Right. Get your snoot out of my face, you dumb pig. Oh, my face hurts. But I fooled the cops. Yeah, I'll hide here all night and then I'll get away. I gotta get away. Bursting in my house this way. Shut up, farmer. Open your mouth and I'll kill you. Yeah, all right. You're gonna hide me, see? I need clothes and food, and I need medicine for my face. It's all cut and swollen. Those cops got me crazy running and hiding and running. I can't stand no more. I'll kill you. I'll kill everyone. What's that? Coppers outside in the car. Yeah. You wanna die? You wanna die right now? No, no, no. And don't tell them about me. I gotta hide. I can. Those rafters up by the ceiling. I can climb up there. All right. Keep facing me while I climb up. Yes, yes. One bullet will kill you, and I got plenty. No, no, don't, don't shoot. There. I'm all set now, Farmer. A gun's pointing right down at you through these cracks in the window. Hello, Jim. Uh, hello, Sheriff. Jim, we're looking for an escaped convict. You seen anything of a stranger around these parts? No, Sheriff. Well, he's here somewhere. We've been trailing him two days now. He won't stop till we get him. Yes. Hey, what's that? Uh, what? That noise. Heaven, the rafters up there. The rafters? I, I didn't hear anything. <clears throat> Probably some uh, chipmunks got in up there. Jim, you feeling all right? Well, yes. Your face is pale. Oh, I'm, I'm all right, you say you haven't seen anything of a stranger at all? Oh, no, Sheriff, no. I... Well, then I won't take up any more of your time. All right, boys. Outside. Yes, yeah, sure. All right, let's go. How's it going, Jim? Hey. But I'm taking you with me. All right, Jim. You can talk now. He's in there, isn't he? Yes, yes, Sheriff. Up, up on the rafters. He's got a gun. I knew something was wrong the way you acted. You'll get him. Keep your guns on that door, men. Right. Join us in there. He tries to come out, shoot. Right. Phil, you come with me. Right. We'll go around back and climb in through the window. Come on. Here we are. I'll go in first. Careful, Sheriff. He's got a gun. Give me a hand. I'll pull you in. Okay, Joyner. We have you surrounded. Come down from those rafters or I'll shoot up through the floor. I'll give you just five seconds, Joyner. Yeah, look. His hand falling over the side of the plank. Dropping his gun. Wait a minute. Maybe a trick. Oh. See his body. It's slipping off the rafters. He's falling down. Look out. Conscious. What's wrong with him? Roll him over. Look at his face. It's fallen twice its right size. You can't even see his eyes. He's burning up with fever. It's all infected. Blood poisoning? Most likely. What a sight he is. Yes. Looks like Joyner outsmarted himself for good this time. All right. Help me lift him. 
to get him to the prison hospital. And Earl Joyner had outsmarted himself, Colonel Schwartzko. Though he always claimed he'd never die in a prison, he died in the prison hospital two days later, and from infection on his face caused by his hiding in the pig pen, and the pigs sloshing the filth all over him. This has been a powerful case, Superintendent Ryer. Here was a young man who deliberately turned to crime at the age of 22. How old was he when he died? Just 23. He thought he was too smart for the law, and he really met his death from the pigs. Thank you, Superintendent Dreyer. And now, before we broadcast our nationwide clues, here is Frank Gallup with a suggestion. These days, the youngsters practically live in their roller skates, even clumping up and down the stairs despite all your warnings. And, of course, they fall occasionally. So that means reaching for your bottle of reliable Sloan's liniment. Yes, for the past two generations, mothers all over the world have helped their children find relief from muscular aches and pains with Sloan's, the family friend in need. All you need to do is pat on Sloan's, that's all. Just pat Sloan's on that black and blue mark. Or Charlie horse. And tell Sister Sue or young Bobby to stay quiet for a while. In a very few minutes, they'll feel that gentle and beneficial warmth begin to chase the ache right out of their sore and hurting muscles. For Sloan's, like a heat treatment, brings you quick and comforting relief without any painful rubbing or massage. That's why millions count on Sloan's liniment whenever any member of the family is suffering from muscular distress. Many of you I know always make sure there's a bottle of Sloan's on your medicine shelf at all times. Just the same, before you go to bed tonight, just check your supply. The past few weeks have been pretty wet and blustery. The kind of weather that so frequently brings stiff necks and sore backs with it. Perhaps your bottle of Sloan's liniment is practically empty. If it is, make a note to get Sloan's liniment from your druggist tomorrow. It's wise to be prepared. And now, the clues. If you have any information concerning these clues, notify your local police, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, or gangbusters at once. For Sloan's liniment next week, the amazing narrative of Fantasy Farms, a mysterious mansion guarded by an electric eye, dungeons sunk deep into the earth, Ammunition hidden in the walls. Trick furniture that held enough guns to blow up a battalion of invaders. And still the law enforcement authorities were able to cope with this secret gang, smoke them out of their lair, and break up this vicious mob for all time. Don't miss this gripping Phillips H. Lord public service dramatization of Gangbusters. Give to the Red Cross War Relief Fund and give generously today through your local chapter. Gangbusters, police, the G-men are government agents marching against the underworld. Tonight, the case of the Wolverine. A shrinking, shadowy figure who stole out of the raging blizzards of the North Country to spread terror and destruction. That's tonight's Gangbusters. Picture our setting as a special office turned over to gangbusters by Commissioner Louis J. Valentine of the New York City Police. For a proxy interview between Colonel H. Norman Schwarzkopf, United States Army, and Tim Curran, former sheriff, Delta County, Michigan. Colonel Schwarzkopf, I understand tonight's case has a very unusual setting, Sheriff Curran. Yes, Schwarzkopf. The death was North Woods on the upper peninsula of the state of Michigan. And it was out of the swirling blizzards of this region that the criminal known as the Wolverine struck. When I hear you mention blizzards, Colonel Schwarzkopf, my ears go right up. Hi, Frank. Well, blizzards, cold, and rain make up what I call Sloan's liniment weather. And this winter, with fuel so carefully rationed, I'm going to make heavier demands than ever on your bottle of reliable Sloan's liniment. So be prepared, as families the world over have prepared themselves during the past 50 years. Always have a bottle of Sloan's liniment handy. Sloan's, you know, takes only a jiffy to apply and usually brings you quick and comforting relief in almost no time at all. No painful rubbing or massaging. Just pat Sloan's on that sore place and relax for a few minutes. You'll actually feel Sloan's go to work like a heat treatment, which seems to soothe the tightness and tiredness right out of that aching muscle. Don't let winter catch you unprepared. Ask your favorite druggist for a bottle of Sloan's liniment tomorrow. And now, Colonel, what about the blizzards you were discussing? Well, Sheriff Curran... Where and when does the case of the Wolverine begin? Late one cold winter's night near the town of Gross, Michigan. A freight trapper, Pierre de Gann, and his dog, trotted through the heavy snowdrift, 
toward the shack of another isolated copper, John Charles. It was beginning to snow heavily. A blizzard was setting in. But soon we warm up at Mr. Charles' place, huh? Ah, there she is, my girl. She delights with the pine tree. I bet Mr. Charles be surprised to see us after all this month. Come on, boy. Mr. Charles! He says, ah. You wouldn't go out and leave the lights on. Maybe something wrong. Hey, look at that. The door seems to be opened by itself. Come on, boy. We go in and see. He says, ah. Well, the 
situation like a nice house. Probably warmer outside than in here. Be long after midnight. Jumped and expect that thing to ring. Sure, if anyone knows I'm here. Hello? 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 Well, who is it? Who is it? I was just wondering, Detective Ross, if you were lonely down there at North Escanaba. Who is it? Well, whoever you are, if you got anything to tell, you better say it. Mark money. Oh. But he was. 
We had every bill in the Gladstone Station marked. And this dollar bill certainly has our marking on it. Well, well, you told me, Chief Craig, well, to watch all the bills for that little mark on it. I do it. I see the mark on that dollar. Uh, you say it was your plan to give you this dollar, Nick? Absolutely, Chief Craig. Well, positively, without the no perception. This morning in my lunch room, he gave it to me. I remember well, I started to roll it up into my napkin and throw it away, but the Pierre de Gaulle, he was there, he didn't. He saw me almost to throw it away. Ah, oh, I wonder where the parents got it. I know his parents back in town, Nick. I understand you bought a ranch out west. Well, sure, but I ain't saying to Mr. Payne who stole this money, Chief Crosswell. I'm just saying to Mr. Payne who gave it to me. Maybe somebody else to give it to Mr. Payne. Well, you did a good job spotting it, Nick. It's the first mark, Bill. It's turned up. <laughs> Pretty good eyes to see an old man, eh? Yeah. When I see it in my cash register, I get so excited, I knock over two cash of a box. <laughs> yeah. Well, I know the hotel Mr. Payne's stopping at. Uh, I think I'll go up over there and see what he can tell me about this dollar bill. Yes? Who is it? Police Chief Croswell. Police? Oh. Just a minute. Hello, Mr. Perrins. I heard you were back in town. Well, I was wondering if you had any idea where you picked it up. Oh, I see. Where I picked it up? Yeah. I know, Chief. I'm afraid I can't help you. I might have gotten it anywhere. Well, uh, can you think where you changed any bills? You may even have more of the mark money on you. Take a look in your wallet. My wallet? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I have it right here in my back pocket. Hey. What's the idea of that gun, Perrins? As I hear it, no, copper. Stand around and watch that, that closet in the corner. Come on. Oh. Move the Wolverine. Move or I'll plug you. Yeah. I know you will. Pretty clever, Mark, on that money, Chief. But I won't help you now. Open that closet door, Chief. Now get him. What? Oh, I can't get around the door. It's all closed, eh? I'll fix your arm up. Now, wise guy. Not because I got his gun. I got a trap. No, you don't, Paris. Where we are, I shoot. Good shot. Go right through that balcony window. A quick search of the alley, Colonel, showed where Parent had landed. There were blood stains in the snow. Chief Croswell, following the stains and seeing that they led toward the railroad traps, hurried back to headquarters and rounded up all available men. All right, men. Now get right into some place like. Left stains leading toward the track. I checked for the railroad and there's no train passing through. This time we got the Wolverine in the open. Oh, well, Jim, you'll be ready to swear in more deputies. We need them. I let you know. Right, sir. Okay, men. Everyone set? Okay. I will spread out and cover the railroad track. Come on, let's go. The trail led along the railroad for half a mile, Colonel, and then branched off into heavy brush and woodland, where the bunch was lost. Then, just before midnight, a report came that footprints, evidently apparent, had been seen entering the forest four miles to the east. Chief Croswell and Pierre de Gun, whose dog Parent had killed, and who since had been deputized, were nearest the spot and picked up the trail. It was 18 below zero. Snow falling heavily. Chief Croswell, this snow is falling so fast, he's blood out Parent's foot. Oh, well, we've got to hurry, Pierre. Uh, looks like he's heading for Big Pike Lake and the railroad beyond. And you're the best trapper in the state, Pierre. Yeah? If anybody can tell him, you can. Yes, we got to be careful, Chief Roswell. The so may wait in ambush and kill before we see him. Yeah. Huh? Something moving over there by those bushes. That is just another of those squares that is ever bunched together in wolf pack, Chief Roswell. We be in one tough, but where? Yeah. Well, let's go on. That's for sure what could Stop. There is something up ahead this time. Yeah. Uh, a shack to get back of the street. That's probably my plan. How did this way? To get to that track. 
Out of the wind. We sneak up the left side window. Careful now. See any dim? No. Look something inside. I'll try the door. Missing. Come on. 
still go on in the opposite direction. Sheriff Cohn, the police did a remarkable job in ending the menace of the Wolverine. Thank you for telling us this case. Yes, Colonel Schwarzkopf. This apparent had proved one of the most elusive and wily criminals. But today, this apparent is behind bars with the Marquette State Prison in Michigan. Well, it certainly was quick thinking on the part of Sheriff Kim and Detective Ross in using that hand car to cut off Barron's escape. I was just going to mention that, Colonel Schwarzkopf. But when Detective Ross complained a few seconds ago that his back was half broke with working the hand car, it brought to my mind the many letters we received from regular railroad men applauding Sloan's liniment. And praise from them is praise indeed. Yes, Sloan's liniment helps to save many an hour's work that might otherwise be lost. And these days, when every pair of hands count, that's important. And that's the reason so many men make sure to keep a bottle of Sloan's liniment on the job with them, as well as on the medicine shelf at home. Because Sloan's is the pat-on liniment. All you need is a few minutes during a rest period or your lunch hour to apply it to that sore and aching muscle. Like that heat treatment, Sloan's will be helping to bring you quick and comforting relief while you work. Just pat Sloan's on. That's all there is to it. So tonight or tomorrow, on your way home from work, drop in at a convenient drugstore and get a bottle of dependable Sloan's liniment to keep in your locker. You'll find Sloan a real friend in need when you want relief in a hurry. And now, Gangbusters presents its nationwide cruise of criminals still at large. Wanted for questioning, murder, man described as 70, about 5 feet 8 inches, 160 pounds, thinning gray hair, parted left side, thinning gray hair, parted left side, gray brown eyes with prominent cold feet, gray brown eyes with prominent cold feet, no teeth, refers to himself as yours truly. Man of 70, gray hair parted on left side, crow's feet around eyes, refers to himself as yours truly. Man fitting this description, thought for questioning concerning murder by Sheriff's Office, Port Orchard, Washington. Charged with bank robbery. George Thompson, 32, 6 feet, 1 quarter inch, 155 pounds, hair dark, combed back, long nose, deformed, slopes the right side, long nose, deformed, slopes the right side, long neck with prominent Adam's apple, long neck with prominent Adam's apple, large hands. Large hands, walk very erect, walk very erect, never wears hat, likes to play cards, never wears hat, likes to play cards. Man, 32, tall, slim, nose sloping to right, long neck with prominent Adam's apple. Man fitting this description, wanted for questioning, bank robbery. Katona, New York. Charged with violation, National Motor Vehicle Theft Act, Edward Hendrickson, 42, 5 feet 9 inches, 165 pounds, heavy black hair, dark eyes, scar over right eye, scar right cheek, scar left front chin, Mole, left cheek, nose turns up at end, nose turns up at end, gold cap, upper front tooth, gold cap, upper front tooth, tip, left index finger, amputated, tip, left index finger, amputated, neat dresser, likes to play golf, bridge, If you have any information concerning these clues, notify your local police, 
the Federal Bureau of Investigation, or gangbusters at once. And now here's what Phyllis H. Lord has planned for next week. Gangbusters, friends, for Sloan's liniment next week, we're going to take you behind the scenes as a modern police department unravels a series of baffling incidents. Learn how the police found a paper matchbox, an umbrella, and an antifreeze tag. Hear how these small articles set the police on the trail of an infamous gang and the startling climax. You won't want to miss one second of next week's gripping Sloan's liniment presentation of Gangbusters. Gangbusters is a Philip H. Lord production which has originated in New York. The radio program that brings you authentic facts on criminal case histories. Sloan Liniment presents Gangbusters. City Police, official facts on the Broadway and Coney Island murder. Speaking of murderous careers, are you working part-time for the Axis? No, of course not, and don't be indignant. I merely wanted to make my point. Maybe your back or your arm is working for the Axis without you knowing it. You see, if you have an aching back, a stiff neck, or a sore arm as a result of overexertion, strain, or fatigue and you don't do anything about it fast enough, you're losing valuable time and effort and playing right into the hands of the enemy. The quickest and most effective relief for muscular aches and pains is Sloan's liniment. Because Sloan's is the easy pat-on liniment that works just like a heat treatment without any painful rubbing or massage. You see, the actual pain of muscular distress is caused by blood congestion. But when you pat on Sloan's liniment, A soothing, concentrated warmth quickly penetrates to the affected spot, breaks up that congestion, and helps permit the blood to circulate freely again. Your arm feels almost like new, and so do you. So next time muscular distress attacks and you need help in a hurry, get Sloan's liniment. And now, gangbusters in the case of the unknown killer. Picture our setting as a special office turned over to gangbusters, by Commissioner Louis J. Valentine of the New York City Police for a proxy interview between Colonel H. Norman Schwarzkopf, United States Army, and Inspector Charles N. Stilson, New York City Police, retired. Thank you, Charles Stark. Inspector Stilson, tonight's case is one of the strangest in many years. Uh, Yes, Colonel Schwarzkopf. For the police were not only dealing with cold-blooded murder, but a gang leader whose identity was unknown even in the underworld. Where does tonight's case begin, Inspector Stilson? Well, Colonel Schwarzkopf, it was ten minutes after midnight of April the 16th, 1939. A man sat before a battered roll-top desk in a dimly lit office on a side street off Broadway, New York City. He was busily stuffing rolls of bills into a black leather briefcase. Suddenly, the telephone rang. Yeah, who is it? That you, Mercurio? Who is it? Mean to say you don't recognize my voice? Who are you trying to kid? Oh, it's you. Where are you? I mean, uh, you in town? Where are you? Never mind where I am. I want to see you, Mercurio. No, wait a minute. You, you got me wrong. Did I say anything? I just said I'm going to pay you a little visit. Say in about 20 minutes. Oh, wait. Let me explain. You got it all wrong. Have I? Still kidding yourself, huh? I'm coming up to your office, Mercurio, and I'm putting daylight into your brain. Hello? 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 Oh, this money. The briefcase. In my way, Mercurio? You? But I, I thought you said 20 minutes. I... Just my little joke. I was calling from the phone booth next door. Listen, let's talk this over. Can't we talk it over? The gun's in my overcoat pocket. Shall we turn up this alley? Alex. Get going. Please, you've got to believe me. I wasn't holding out your share of the door. 
Oh, that's how it's a nice little alley to walk in, isn't it? Look, the dose in this briefcase, you can have all of it, every cent. Big-hearted guy all of a sudden. Yeah, take the briefcase. Now we're square, pal. We're, we're square. That's right, Mercurio. All but this. We can talk in this compartment. What do you want to know? Well, he's this way, copper. This guy what sent you through Chicago to get me. He's a big shot, ain't he? Big as they come. How come he sent for me? Well, you see, Gonzalez, the guy whose job you're taking double-crossed him. So there's an open spot in his mouth. Oh. You see, the boss keeps his ear to the ground... Is that you're doing a good job in Chicago, so he sends for you. What kind of guy this boss is, Copper? I don't know too much about him myself, Gonzalez. Huh? You're his head man, ain't you? Yeah, sure. But I don't pay to get curious. How with this guy? Where are we going to meet in New York? His office or headquarters? Boss don't have no headquarters. Like that, people he don't want to see can't pay surprise visits. Hmm. That's a good idea. Yeah. Does all his business on crowded subway stations. So that's where we're going to meet him. You know, Calvert, this is the first time I've been down in New York subway. Yeah? Yeah. Well, this is the busiest subway station in the world, Gonzalez. Times Square. Where do you suppose all these papers are going, huh? Okay. Come on, we'll walk down to this end of the station where it's left and right, huh? We gotta wait long? You can answer that as well as me. Well, I know we were told to wait. Hello, Captain. Huh? Oh, boss, I, I didn't see you back at that post. And you're Gonzalez. That's right. Glad to know you. I've heard some good things from Chicago about you, Gonzalez. Handy with a rod, they tell me. Yeah, both hands. Good. I'll try that handy yard tonight on the payroll job. Capper, yes. get a car and we'll meet at the usual place near Coney Island at 8 o'clock. All right, boss. Okay, now separate and I'll see you tonight. That's the movie house over there by the boardwalk. Now, you got your part straight, Capper? Yeah, yeah sure, killer. I stay in the car and be ready for the getaway. How about you, Gonzalez? Very right, sure. When the manager comes out with the money, I... Uh, uh, massage him with the bullet. For the last time, I'm telling you that I'll handle the manager. If you take care of the cop, we'll be with him. Well, I figure I handle both of them. You do what you're told. The boss, they're coming out of the movie now. Okay, Gonzalez, get out of the car. Capper... Be ready for a fast getaway. I'll be ready. Come on, Gonzalez. Keep your gun out of sight till we're on top of it. Have a boss. Okay, now. A few more steps. Just look at that cop. He's thinking. Now, kill him. Help! Hold up! Help! We've got no time to waste on you, mister. I got the money. Hey, wait, the cop ain't dead yet. Now he is. Here comes the car. Come on, boy. Stop it. Nice job. Shut up. Get going. Come on, get going. Urgent. Patrolman Leon Fox murdered by bandits. In hold up on Surf Avenue, Coney Island, all patrolmen in Coney Island area, canvas section for eyewitnesses to crime, homicide squad report to headquarters at once. Come in. Captain Edison, this man out here wants to see you about Coney Island murder. Now bring him in, Sergeant Hurley. I'm Captain Dennison. Sergeant says you have some information about Patrolman Fox's murder. That's right, Cap. 
Uh, my name is Siggy Nash. I'm a photographer. You know, I take pictures. Movies? Well, sort of. You know, you're moving along the sidewalk, and I snap your picture. And you send me two bits, and you get the real art job. Yeah. You know. I see. And now, about the information you have. Yeah, well, uh, on this night when the two rods burned down the copper, uh, I mean the policeman, I'm working Fifth Avenue across in the movie house. Then you see? saw the hold-up? Well, no, not exactly, Cap. See, I'm busy pursuing my profession. I'm taking a close-up of a slick chick that's anchoring down the avenue, and then the fireworks start. Oh. Uh, later, though, I develops the picture, and I take one look, and I figure that's the McCoy. Here, take a gander at this. Yeah, that's very nice, but... Hey, what's that in the background? That's why I said it's the McCoy. See, there's a guy sitting in a car. As soon as the shooting starts, he gets underway, and he picks up them two stick-ups. Good work, Siggy. Sergeant, come here. Yes, yes sir. Now, Sergeant, take this photograph down to identification. Have them make a blow-up of the face of that man in the car. See if anybody can identify it. Yes, sir. Siggy, I want you to know that we're grateful for your cooperation. Oh, I think nothing of it, Cap. It's all part of a day's work. You sure was a slick chick, wasn't she, huh? <laughs> Ain't often I get a dame what's so, uh, photogenic. What's well, so on, Cap? Captain Dennison's office. Sergeant Hurley, sir. I'm down at identification now. We've identified the man in the car. Excellent, Sergeant. Who is he? A gunman named Kappa. We've had him in on several homicides, but he's been able to wriggle out of them. Served time for assault some years back. Have Kappa picked up immediately, Sergeant. I'll get the men out of right away, Captain. We know Kappa's usual hangouts should only take a couple of hours. All right, get going. You say that fellow sort of captain spends a lot of time here in your pool room, Bonnie. Oh, yes, sir, Sergeant. He, he's a nice boy, too. He, you know, he's uh, never no trouble. Uh, uh, what's he do for a living? Working? Working? Hey? <laughs> Why? When he's so lucky with the dice, so I work. Hey? What makes you think he's lucky? Why, uh, on the other day, he comes to me, uh, I got a chance of $120 in a silver, two bills. <laughs> I shouldn't be so lucky. Oh, here he comes now. Hello, Captain. Hello, Benny. Hello. Just a minute, Captain. How are you? Sergeant Hurley, police department. Uh, what do you want from me? I ain't done nothing. Sure, sure. Just what I tell him, Captain. He's all right. We'd just like to have you drop down to headquarters a little talk. Suppose well, they don't want to come. Well, I think I can persuade you. Okay, I got nothing to worry about. Uh, no. Keep that corner table empty, Captain. Benny. I'll be sure. back in a half an hour. All right, all right. Come on, Captain. Captain's anxious to get the answers to those questions. It's a penny. You think it's a quiz program. Oh, yes, you think it's a quiz. It's funny. Personally, I prefer crooners, Captain. I kind of think you're going to croon plenty. All right, Captain. It's no use calling around anymore. You're going to tell us who the two other men were who killed Patrolman Fox. Oh, the love of my Captain. Ain't you been listening to me? I tell you, I don't know what you're talking about. Stand up when you talk to Captain. Okay. All right now, Captain. Who are the two men you picked up in that car after the shooting? I tell you, I didn't pick up no one. I was just driving along. Just driving along, huh? Just drive. Who told you to stand up? Uh, he did the sergeant. Well, sit down and hurry up about it. Okay, okay. What are you doing driving along Surf Avenue? Just driving along, I tell you. So that's all you got to say for yourself, just driving, huh? Okay, Kappa, put your hat on. We're going up to the DA's office. Well, it's okay with me. It'd be better than all these questions you guys... Take that hat off. The sergeant just told me to and put it... And who told you to stand up? Didn't I say sit down? Yeah, sure. Well, sit down. Hey, you guys ought to make up your mind. Put a man in that car with you. I tell you, there were no guys in the car with what me. What are you waiting for? I said to come along with me. Holy smoke, what are you guys trying to do? Stand up when you talk to the sergeant. Well, you just told me nothing. Well, to... that I told you. What are you going to tell us about the two other men in the killing? Oh, give me a break, will you? I, I, I can't think straight. First, you tell me to stand up, sit down. He, he tells me to put on my head off. I didn't mean nothing, Captain. I was just showing you. You know, I gave Fox a break, Kappa. You drove the murder car, Kappa. No, I'm not telling you. You I said, said before you did drive the car. Yeah, yeah, sure. I, I mean, it I... It might go easier on if you'd cooperate. Stand on your feet when the captain's talking to you. I don't know nothing. I tell you, I wasn't near the movie that night. You said you were driving along Surf Avenue, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, sure. Well, that's right by the movie, isn't it? Yeah, sure. Show him that photograph, Sergeant. There you are, my friend. See what's directly behind you? 
The movie house where the killing took place. I'm being framed, I tell you. Get back on that chair. Oh, I'll let up, will you? Where'd you get $120 in silver the day after the holdup? In a crap game, I tell you. You're lying, Capper. Who's in this with you? Nobody. I ain't in you it. You fired the first shot. I didn't. Gonzalez. Gonzalez. He says you Are did. you going to let him pin it on you? Who is Gonzalez? I don't know any Gonzalez. You just said you did. Stand up on your feet. Okay, okay. Gonzalez wouldn't punch for you like this. Let me think, will you? What are you standing up for? I'll lay off, with you? your last chance, Capper. Where's Gonzalez? Where's about Gonzalez? Come on. Okay, okay. Okay, I'll tell you only let up on me. He's a... He's at the Alvin Hotel, room 704. Now, will you leave me alone? Who's the other one? I won't tell you. I don't know nothing. You can't make me say no more. All right, Sergeant. Take him away. We're going over to that hotel and pay a call on this fellow Gonzalez. Front, boy. Yeah, Mr. Crane. Take this luggage up to room 501. All this stuff for one guy? He must be the four Hawaiian. Never mind the wisecracks. Take the stuff up. Honest, Mr. Crane, I can't. My back's so sore, I just can't lift anything. Didn't you pat that Sloan's liniment on? Well, gee, I meant to, Mr. Crane, but a couple of boys came up. You go to the drugstore and get some Sloan's liniment. I, I just pat it on, huh? Not rub it. Right, just pat Sloan's on. It'll work like a heat treatment. Gee, thanks, Mr. Crane. Hey, wasn't that Captain Dennison just went up the elevator with that police sergeant? Never mind that. You go get that Sloan's liniment and pat it on quick. Yep. And get back here fast so you can get to work. Here's the hotel room, Captain 704. All right. You know how to handle it, Sergeant? Yes, sir. Have your gun ready. There's no telling what we may walk into. Maybe Gonzalez's not in. Yeah? Telegram for you, Mr. Gonzalez. Telegram? Oh, okay. Shove it under the door. It's collect. 63 cents I gotta get. Okay. Wait a second. Okay, well, let's have... Hey, so what is this? This is a police special 38 caliber. I wouldn't try to reach that artillery in your shoulder harness if I were you. I'll take that gun, Gonzalez. Got a permit for it? Who are you guys? I'm Captain Dennison. This is Sergeant Hurley. We're arresting you for carrying a gun without a permit. And if it happens that the bullets from that gun match the bullets that killed Patrolman Fox, it's murder. I've been framed. What brought you here? A pal of you is named Tappas. Remember him? He told us where we'd find you. Kappa. Where do you rat? You have stayed in Chicago. Oh, the talk, Gonzalez, or are you going to take the rap for your pal? I don't know nothing. Who was the third man, Gonzalez? I don't know what he's talking about. Anything interesting around, Sergeant? Yeah, here's something. What do you make of it, Captain? I keep Gonzalez covered, Sergeant. Let me see. That's an ammo pad. It's like a number was written on the top sheet, then torn off. Yes, you can see the indentation on the next sheet. I think I can make it out. Looks like E Q Equator. I can't make out the numbers. What are they, Gonzalez? It's doing swell, Kappa. All right, Gonzalez, we'll show you something. First, we'll take this piece of pencil there and blow the graphite dust over the indentations like this. We got anything of it? Equator five three. I can't quite make out the rest. Who's had that number, Gonzalez? I should tell you, my girlfriend. If you take me to headquarters, take me to headquarters. It looks like two, one, three. I'll try it, Captain, see what we get. Pretty anxious, Gonzalez. We're waiting right here. Huh? Whoever the third man is, he'll probably get in touch with you, and without knowing it, he's also going to get in touch with us. Well, you guys got me on a gunshot. What do you want to wait around here for? Shut up, Gonzalez. Sergeant, get that phone number to headquarters and have the men check its location. Yes, sir. Meanwhile, I'll notify the telephone company and have them put an extension phone in this room right away. Oh, I get it, sir. Yes. We're going to wait here and listen in on whoever phones our friend. So sit down, Gonzalez. Make yourself comfortable. We're here for the duration. Sit down. How about some midnight coffee, Captain? Should I phone down to the hotel clerk? Yeah, and look, Copper, make it a hamburger, too, will you? 
I'm hungry. Stay sitting in that chair, Gonzalez. Have the men checked that phone number, Sergeant? Yes, Captain. It's a bar room. They're keeping it under watch. Uh, we'll wait in this hotel room all week if necessary till Gonzalez gets the call. And remember, Gonzalez, we'll be listening on the extension form. Say just what you're told and not another word. But it's two against one. What can I... Okay. Get a gun on, Gonzalez. You bet. Now, Gonzalez, lift that receiver the same time I lift this extension form. Hello? Gonzalez? Yeah. Where's Kappa? Tell him he's up here. Go on. He's up here. I told him to wait at his rooming house, didn't I? Put him on the phone. Tell him you can't. He's drunk. Go on, if you know what's good for you. He, he, he can't. He's, uh, all ginned up. What? I'm down in the lobby. I'll be right up. Quick, Sergeant. Handcuff Gonzalez and jump in that closet. No, yet. don't. Oh, you got him? Uh, there we are. Now in your go. Hey, let me out of here. Tear him off with that noise. Yeah, you better drag him out of there quickly and gag him. There's a front door, Sergeant. Come on. What the hell? Mr. Sergeant? Bullets went right by my head. There he goes, down the corridor. Stop! He's making it to the elevators, Captain. Watch it, he's going to shoot again. He got away into that elevator. Now get to a phone. Call downstairs, have the lobby covered. Captain, the elevator indicator is going up. All right, we'll see where it stops and rush to that floor. Stop on a ten. Okay, come on. Up the stairs, fast. Oh, Edward, did you hear that noise? It sounded like shock. It's probably a suspect, Brian, honey. Oh. Are you almost ready to leave? As soon as I call my hair. I'm going to phone the hotel manager downstairs. I'm certain that wasn't a truck. Oh. Don't move. Who are you? Shut up. Yeah, I'm already ready to... What is this? Don't talk. Ed, he has a gun. Do as he says. That's smart, sister. I've already killed two guys in my life, and I'll kill you if I have to. What do you want? The cops have got me stowed up in this hotel. You're going to hide me until the coast is clear. Do as he says, Ed. I'm frightened. You, sister, come here. Oh, what for? You're just about my size. Maybe I can squeeze into your clothes and get out of here. Take your hands off my wife. Keep back, or I'll pump a bullet into oh, you. Oh, no, you don't. <laughs> Get out of my way before I give you the same. Police! Police! Stupid game. <laughs> All right, now, madam. Please, try and pull yourself together. Tell us what happened. My husband, he killed him. Oh. We've got the hotel surrounded. The killer can't get away. Uh, probably for me. Yeah? This is Sergeant Hurley, Captain. He's been spotted on the mezzanine. We're cutting it off now. Good. How about the elevators? All cut off, Captain. All staircases are covered, and all guests have been notified not to unlock their doors. All right, Sergeant. Bring an elevator up to this floor. I'll meet you at the elevator shaft. Yes, sir. Be right up. Has he been sighted since you spoke to me, Sergeant? No, sir. Well, he must still be on the mezzanine. Now, take me down there. We've got all exits covered, sir. He can't get out. He's already killed one person in the hotel. He may kill others. Come on. We'll go over every foot of this floor ourselves. Captain, down there. Someone coming out that door. It's him. See the gun? He ran back inside. Come on. Careful, now. Maybe right around this corner. He is. He's running into a dead end. According to the floor plan, this leads to the main ballroom. There he goes, through that door at the far end. That's the ballroom. All exits are covered. Careful. We make a good target and we can't see him. Hey, I'll shoot! Uh, my arm. He winged me. I'm going in after Careful, him. Captain. He's gun crazy. There's only one way to treat a mad dog. Come on out while you're still alive. Stay back! How are your men off? You haven't got a chance. Stay back, I tell you. I'll get you like I get the rest of them. Stay back. You're finished. If you kill me, there'll be others. They'll keep coming till they get you. Come on out. You ain't taking me. You'll be running out of bullets soon. It's your last chance to give up. No. You ain't taking me. No. 
Captain, you all right? I'm all right, Sergeant. Now, this fellow isn't going to give us any more trouble. Captain, look who he is. Yeah. Abe Beetler, the killer. The guy we've been after for the killing of that bookie. Yeah. No one will ever know how many men Beetler really killed. Funny that his last victim should be himself. Yes, Colonel Schwarzkopf. The ambushing of Abe Beetler in a crowded New York City hotel after he had already killed an innocent man living there was one of the most tense and dangerous situations that I know of. Well, thanks to the fearless work of those police officers, Inspector Stilson, Beetler's only escape proved to be one that removed him forever as a menace to society. Thank you, Inspector Stilson, for telling these facts. And now, Gangbusters listeners, we're going to bring you urgent nationwide clues on persons who are being sought this very minute by police and federal authorities throughout the country. These nationwide clues that have played a vital part in bringing almost 300 criminals to justice so far are broadcast every week by Gangbusters, brought to you by Sloan's Liniment. For half a century, Sloan's Liniment has been helping millions of Americans handle surprise attacks of muscular distress. Here's how. You just pat Sloan's on. Almost immediately, it goes to work like a heat treatment, swiftly, comfortingly. Yes, you'll actually feel that welcome, penetrating warmth and its promise of quick and blessed relief. So don't let muscular distress get you down. Don't stand one single moment of needless suffering. Be prepared with a bottle of Sloan's liniment on your medicine shelf at home and an extra bottle handy at your job. Remember, when muscular distress attacks and you need help in a hurry... Get Sloan's Liniment. And now, Gangbusters Clues. Gangbusters listeners, our first clue tonight concerns a dangerous subject, Fred Williams Poole, against whom a complaint was filed before United States Commissioner, Columbia, South Carolina, charging Poole with fleeing across state lines to avoid prosecution for murder. Note this man's official description very carefully. Fred Williams Pool, many aliases, 56, 5 feet, 7 or 1 half inches, 145 pounds, brown hair, gray, blue eyes, upper and lower front teeth missing, walks with head down, walks with head down, has long criminal record and is reported to have in possession two machine guns, and 45 caliber automatic pistol. Watch for Fred Williams Poole. Here is an urgent wire just received from Warden Alfred Dowd, Indiana State Prison. It concerns convict Ralph L. Williams, who escaped from Honor Prison Farm while serving a 10-year sentence for robbery. This is William's description. Ralph L. Williams, 26, 5 feet 10 inches, 150 pounds, dark brown hair, blue eyes, scar left side forehead, letters L-O-V-E tattooed on four fingers, numbers one, nine, three, five, and word O'Donnell on upper forearm. This man reported to have escaped Honor Prison Farm, Indiana State Prison. Be on lookout for Ralph L. Williams. These are the clues on persons wanted tonight, June 9th, 1944, right this moment. If you have any information on these clues, notify your local police the Federal Bureau of Investigation, or gangbusters at once. And now the highlight facts on next week's case, Colonel Schwarzkopf. Gangbusters, friends, next week we have one of the most dramatic case histories ever presented. The crimes of the woman gang leader. It's a case of many unexpected surprises and developments. I invite you to listen. To next week's gangbusters factual case histories. <laughs> Gangbusters Factual Case Histories is a Philip H. Lord production for the makers of Sloan's Liniment. 
Remember, when you want help in a hurry, get Sloan's Liniment. Mr. Stark, how do you pronounce N-O-N-S-P-I? Non-spy? I pronounce it safe from offending. Oh. Because it acts instantly, dries quickly, and keeps you bath fresh from one to three days. Good. How do medical authorities pronounce N-O-N-S-P-I? Non-spy? They pronounce it safe from skin irritation. Oh. Because so many medical authorities have found it to be non-injurious to the most delicate skin tissues when used according to direction. Wonderful. How do laboratories pronounce N-O-N-S-P-I? Non-spy? They pronounce it safe from clothes damage. Oh. Yes, the Better Fabrics Testing Bureau reports that their analysis shows no damage can be done to clothing by non-spy if user follows directions. Perfect. It's the new liquid deodorant. Comes in 35 and 60 cent sizes at all drug and department stores. Now may I ask how you pronounce N-O-N-S-P-I? Well, after hearing how everyone else pronounces non-spy, I pronounce it bet. This is the Blue Network. Law enforcement departments throughout the United States, the only national program that brings you authentic police case history. Gangbusters. And now to gangbusters and facts that show the operation of our law enforcement officials in their war against the underworld. Gangbusters has asked Chief J.A. Pitcock, who recently retired as Chief of Police, Little Rock, Arkansas, after 31 years of service, to narrate by proxy tonight's case. The inside facts in the case of the costume killer. Chief Pitcock, from what you've told me, I know tonight's case is so fantastic, the facts about this criminal are hard to believe. Yes, Don Gardner, but I've got his signed confession to murder right here in my hand. Well, when did you first hear of this man, Chief Pitcock? Well, Don, our reports start not too many months ago in the city of Paragold, Arkansas. A tall, slim man about 40 had been sitting in the front parlor of his rooming house. He'd heard a knock at the door and he was on his way to answer it. All right, all right. Come on, Mr. Oswey. Well, come in, come in, Joy. Don't stand there like a tired old field horse. Yes, sir. Look, Mr. Oswey, don't be sorry at me because I... Don't tell me here. Come on in the parlor. Yeah. Kids, spend your days and nights trying to pound a little something in their pumpkin head so maybe they'll amount to something. Get in there. Yes, sir. Well, what are you going to tell me, boy? Get it out of here. I think he wasn't born with a tongue. I tried, Mr. Oswey. Honest, I tried. Sit down. Yes, sir. Now, you got to listen to me, boy. For years, I've been showing kids how to do this. Kids, they all think they're smarter than you. Oh, I don't think I'm smarter than you, honest. Uh, well, if you listened close to me and done exactly like I told you, you wouldn't have had no experience like that. I tried, Mr. Oswey. You didn't do it like I told you. You didn't do a thing I told you. Well, I was awfully scared. That cop came pretty close, awful close. Well, if you'd listened to me and if you'd opened the window like I showed you how to open it, you'd have been in there and out. With a stack full of stuff. Before that cop even got close. Yes, sir. I guess I would, but... But nothing. I got boys all over this city and lots of other cities. I showed them what to do and how to do it. Now, me and you are going back to that store tonight. And me and you are going to come home with a gunny sack full of stuff. Yes, sir. And then after we get that, I'm going to show you a few other things. How to disguise yourself up good so nobody can pick you out. How to pick a lock with just a hairpin. How to break a man's arm with just one twist. Do I have to learn that? Of course you got to learn that, boy. Sometimes you got to hurt people. Sometimes when you don't hurt people, you get hurt yourself. And hurt bad. Did you ever hurt anyone? Only because I had to. Bad? Bad enough. I killed him. Killed him? I only two. Oh. oh. That's what I did my time for. And if I'd killed the third one, I wouldn't have done no time at all. But I got soft-hearted. Serves me right. Now, never you get soft-hearted, boy. Oh, no, sir. 
Now you listen to me. And I'll tell you how we're going to get in that store tonight. Maybe you ought to use the glass cutter some more. Shh, boy. Shh. You got it. Sure, I got it. Okay, Joey, I'll give you a boost up. You unlock the window. Yeah. Now grab a hold. Okay. Now, up you go. Okay, now. Reach in, unlock the window. Yes, sir. Wait a minute. A little higher. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I got it. Good boy. Now, come on down. Right. If you hadn't did it like this last night, we wouldn't have all this bother tonight. You got your gunny sack? Yes, sir. Okay. I'm going to boost you in. You know what to take. And when you get it, you meet me back the room. Hey, you coming in with me? Hey, but one way to learn, boy, and that's do it yourself. But, Mr. Osterman... Don't stand there arguing with me. Now, come here. I'll boost you. It ain't fair. Now, up you go. Okay, that's enough. Now jump down. Yep. Everything all right? Yeah, I think so. Good boy. I'll see you back the room. All right, all right, I'm coming. Joey? Yeah, it's me. Just a second. Come in, boy. Yes, sir. Good work, boy. You did fine. You... Where's the gunny sack? Oh, I got it, Mr. Osprey. I left it in the shed. Well, I told you to bring it so I could give you what you got coming. I was gonna, but... But, but what, boy? Speak up. There was a cop waiting in front of my house. A cop? It's a good thing I saw him, Mr. Osprey. An awful good thing. You snitch. You... Please, Mr. Osprey, let go. I didn't have anything to do with it. What's he doing there, then? I don't know. I'll... Huh? Let me go. <laughs> All right, boy. <laughs> if this cop's waiting for you, that ain't good. What do we do? Well, I'll tell you, boy. Uh, you go on home and get to bed. But the cop will That don't me. matter none, boy. You got no record. You get off easy. But I don't want to go to jail. I don't want to. I'll just give you a talking to. With me, it's a sight different. I'm on parole. They send me back to prison for life. You wouldn't want that to happen to your old friend Slim Osry, would you? Oh, no, sir. I wouldn't. Well, now you see why I got to leave town. Anyway, I got some, some of my other boys to look in on. I'll be in touch with you, boy. You'll hear from me. You're a good boy. So, Don, Slim Usry, a parole murderer and tutor in crime, fled to his native town of Hattiesburg, Mississippi, where he sought refuge at the home of his sister, Etta. But Slim Usry's sojourn in Hattiesburg didn't prove as pleasant as he had hoped. Slim? Slim? Slim! Yeah, what's ailing you now? I asked you to weed the garden. Instead, you sit there all day like you with a landlord waiting for his rent. If you want the garden, weed it, weed it yourself. I ain't budging, Etta. I ain't budging an inch. Honest, Slim, it just ain't right. If I feel like it, Etta, I'll sit here all week. I don't know how many times I have to tell you, Slim. You ought to be out working like other men. Now, look here, Etta. Having those work I felt like doing, I'd be out doing it. There ain't no kind of work around this town I feel like doing. Can't you get that through your head? If you don't work, you're blown back in the penitentiary. Now, look here, Etta. I said the penitentiary. Don't you talk to me like that, Etta. The whole town's talking about you. They all know what you are. I got to bear the shame. Who cares? I could see that you're sent back to jail. You shut up, you oh, old king. No, no. no. Yeah. Man, why should I dirty my hands on you? Fine home you give your own brother, always nagging. Don't know when to stop. <laughs> Guess it was a mistake taking you in. No mistake not coming back. I guess you better leave, Slim. I reckon I best. I want you to be packed when I get home. Yeah. What time are you coming back? I won't be back till late tonight. Hey. What? Who's going to fix my supper? Nobody. You're not eating here again. Hey, Edda. You old hen. You ain't sending me back no penitentiary. You ain't even going to think about sending me back. That, Don, was the moment Slim Usry made up his mind to murder his sister Etta. He knew she would walk home that night, and he waited in a clump of weeds until he heard her footsteps. Etta? <laughs> Howdy, Etta. You have a nice time? Oh, Slim, you scared me. Did I, Etta? What were you doing back in those weeds? 
Did you did you lose something? No. I'm just fixing to lose something, that's all. But what do you mean? Nothing, Edna, nothing at all. Are you all, all packed to go? I, I don't want you in my house tonight. I changed my mind, Edna. I'm staying. Who, who said so? I said so, that's who. No, not in my house. No? You, if you don't go tonight, I'm calling the police. You call him, Edna, you call him. Slim, no, 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 don't. Oh, him. Try to send me back to the tent, will you? I'm going to treat a brother. You... <clears throat> You old hen. I'll show you. Treat your brother like a dog. Take care of you. Deputy Sheriff Clarkson. Deputy Clarkson, this is Slim Osry. Yes, Slim. Hi. It's my sister, Edda, Deputy Clarkson. She she left the house yesterday to go visiting. She didn't come home all night. Where'd she go, Slim? Well, I don't rightly know, Deputy Clarkson. But you know Edda. That ain't like her. Something must have happened to her now. Would, would you help me find her? All right, Slim. I'll be right over. So, Don, the murderer, Slim Usry, reported to the authorities that his sister Etta was missing. Although it was Usry himself who killed her. But in carrying out his plan to fool the police, Usry ran into unexpected difficulties. Okay, let's break right here. More from Gangbusters right after these messages on 670 WMAQ. George Burns and Gracie Allen. Austin Blackie. Edgar Bergen. John and Blanche Bickerson. This is Stan Freeberg. Would you pay $60 for 60 of the greatest old-time radio shows of all time? Well, now you can by ordering Old Time Radio's Greatest Shows, a 60-episode collection for only $60. The Whistler, Gangbusters, Philip Marlowe, Gunsmoke, and many more. All on top quality cassettes housed in a designer case. Plus, you also receive a 20-page anecdotal booklet giving you the inside story to each and every show. Hold everything, Stan. This is Carl Amari, owner of Radio Spirits, with a special limited time offer. If listeners call right now and mention this radio station, they can take $10 off the $60 price. But you must call right now and mention this radio station for this special $10 savings. Hey, you don't have to convince me. Order toll-free 1-800-RADIO-48. That's 1-800-723-4648. It's time for Internet Jeopardy. I'll take Internet Service Provider for 100. They're the fastest growing Internet access company in Chicago land. Who is Techport? You're correct. You control the board. I'll take technical support for 500. The company with free 24 hour support. Who is Techport? Right again. Still your turn. Give me Internet Best Buys for 1000, Bob. Now listen closely. They're the company which offers unlimited Internet access, a free homepage for new subscribers, email, and free setup for only one low fee of $19.95 per month. Plus, the first 30 days are free. Who is Techport? Right again. Now, if you answer this next question correctly, you'll double your money and walk away the new Internet Jeopardy champion. How can people sign up with Techport Complete Internet Access? That's easy, Bob. They call 1-800-830-4880 or log on to www.techinter.com. Congratulations. You're our new Internet Jeopardy champion. And remember, Techport is your best source for complete Internet access. Phone 800-830-4880. Now, let's get back to gangbusters. Now, you were telling us, Chief Pitcock, that Slim Usry murdered his sister, Etta, and then reported her missing. Yes, Don. And an investigation was started. The weeded area of the neighborhood was on the list of places where deputies thought the woman might be found. And the search there was in progress. Deputy Clarkson? Yes, Lynn. You don't reckon we'd find Etta in here? If anything happened, Etta, it'd break my heart. I know how you feel, Slim. Let's cut the talk and look. Okay. Uh, Edda. Yeah. Matter, Slim. Hey, boy. Edda. Hold it, man. Hold it. What's the matter? What's the matter? Did you find something to him? Uh, good Lord. Edda. Edda. Come away from us, Slim. Come away. I won't sleep a wink till I get the man who did this. 
I won't sleep a week. Come in. Hello, Deputy Clarkson. Lamb. They said you wanted to see me. Yes. Come on over and sit down. Sure, Deputy Clarkson. Well, you got any idea who killed my sis? Yes, Lamb. I've got a few ideas. Well, you just tell me who it was. I could wring his neck with my two hands. I could... You could what, Slim? Well, you can't blame me none, Deputy Clarkson. Holy letter, never did no harm, no one. Murdered in cold blood like that. You killed two men yourself, Slim. Well, that, that, that was different. What was so different about it? Well, I paid for it. I spent 19 years put away, and I... You don't think it was me killed Edda? Well, I didn't say you killed her, but you could have. Well, I didn't. What did I be killing my own sis for? I haven't any idea. This is a fine thing. I come down here to help you, and I, I get accused of murder. Just because I've been in a little trouble once or twice, you, you can't let a man have no peace. Not even when they're fixing to bury his poor sister. Hey, Slim. Huh? Come here. What do you want? How come it was you, out of all the people looking for Edda, that found her body? You seem to know just where it was. Well, she just happened to be where I was looking. If I killed her, you don't think I'd be fool enough to find the body, do you? Slim, I don't know what to think. Well, Don, a few months went by and no new evidence turned up. Then one day, Slim Musry left town and went to Little Rock, Arkansas. Shortly after he arrived, Usry walked into a costumer's shop on Commerce Street and asked to look at a wig and mustache outfit he saw in the window. Yes, sir. Finest wig and mustache in Little Rock. There you are. Yeah, not bad. I seem better. I uh, take it you're going to a party? Oh, I figured on a couple of parties. You got a... Looking glass, yeah? They look good on. Maybe I'll take them. Right in back here, sir? Oh, yeah. The uh, mustache sticks right on. I can see how it works. Very good. Very good indeed. Nobody'd recognize you. Not with that on. How much? Well, now, let's see. Uh, that'd be, uh, oh, $11.80 with the tax. Okay. Shall I wrap them up for you? Sure, wrap them. You don't think I'm going to wear them now, do you? What a morning, Captain. I had that witness look at every picture in the file. No luck. Not with that wig and mustache disguise. Good disguise. You know, I can't remember anyone using a disguise like that on a hold-up in years. This must be an old-timer. Well, the victim thought he was about 40, Captain. It doesn't make him too much of an old-timer. I wonder if he bought that wig and mustache in one of the shops here in Little Rock. Maybe. But they can't tell whether that stuff came from their shop until they see it. And it looks like we'll have to get our man before they can see it. Hello, Mr. Osry. Huh? Well, Joey. Sit down, boy. Sit down. Thanks, Mr. Osry. Uh, call me Slim, Joey. People around here know me as Slim. Okay, Slim. Thank gravy you growed. How about a beer, Joey? Oh, no, thanks. Later, maybe. I uh, came as soon as I got your letter. Yeah. Well, I wrote to you, boy, because I like you. And I want to do something for you. I was sure glad to hear you didn't go with that reformatory. Well, it was like you said. They gave me a talking to and let me go. <laughs> they haven't caught me since. That's good boy, Joey. I uh, figured when I got your letter, you uh, needed some help. Uh, not just yet, boy. First, you got to finish your lessons. Lessons? Well, I could do okay now. I've been doing okay. Well, maybe you could, but we got to be sure about it. Now, tonight... 
and try my old disguise trick again. You recollect I was telling you once about disguises? Yeah, yeah, I remember. Oh, boy, tonight I got a nice little old cafe all picked out. It'll be so easy I won't need help from you. I wouldn't need you even if you was ready. So you just stick around my room. What'll you have? This hey, thing up. What? Breach. What's the matter? Everybody quiet. Wait a minute. I'll... Wait for nothing. I'm in a hurry. Where's the dough? I'll get it. I'll get it. Hey. 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 It, it was an accident. I don't like accidents. Oh. I don't anybody oh. move. I'm gone. Oh. Anybody follow? Get the thing. Get him. Get him. How bad is he, Sergeant? Luckily, not so bad. Both flesh wounds, Captain. This is his room. Okay. Let's go in. Hello, Mr. Wallace. How do you feel now? Oh, not... not bad, considering... I'm Captain Crossman. Oh, hello. Mr. Wallace... Do you think you could recognize the man who held up your cafe and shot you? I, I, I don't know. Maybe I could. I, I ought to know that mustache anyway. Mm-hmm. Is this the mustache? Yeah. Yeah, that's it. I'd swear that's it. It was found in an alley near your cafe. The hold-up man was seen running up that alley. That's, that, that's it, all right. Thanks, Mr. Walters. We know where it was bought. Now all we've got to do is find the man who bought it. Tell you, Joey, just like I tell all my boys. If you miss doing something one way, no matter how many times it worked, it ain't good no more. Uh, that seems crazy to me. All you gotta do is get another mustache. No, boy, the police and everybody else on that mustache and wig trick, I gotta try something else. Yeah, but you promised I could try the mustache trick. I said no, boy. When I say no, I mean it. Maybe we'll pick up and go someplace else and try it. But not here in Little Rock. Oh, it's not Slim. And we're just getting set here. Well, I don't know where I'm going to stay or not. They got a big charge against me. I could have killed that man last night. Oh, the guy was shot up a little. Serves him right. Maybe I should have killed him. Sure. So, he'd have been number three. Uh-uh, Joey. Number four. Number four? You heard me. You mean you killed somebody since I saw you last? What if I did? If you want no account. I'm getting back. We've got to change our way of operating. We've got to do... Boy, where are you going? I'm uh, going out to some air. Well, now watch out where you go and what you do. Well, just going out to get you a present. Present, boy? For me? Sure. And uh, one for myself. I'll uh, see you later, Slim. This is Sergeant Woods. We've got men planted at that costume store. Nothing doing yet, Captain. Well, keep them there. And at the other stores, too. Okay, Captain, but it's pretty much of a shot in the dark. This fellow'd be a chump to come back for another mustache. Maybe. But if he does come back, I want a welcoming party for him. Joey? Yeah, Slam, open up. Where you been, boy? Get in here. I told you I was going out to buy a present. Oh. Is that it there? Uh-huh, that's it. Well, don't stand there, boy. If you're going to give it to me, give it here. <laughs> I got two of them. What is it? Give it here, boy. Ah, uh, not until you promise I can use one. One what? One of these mustache outfits. Wait. Mustache outfits? Uh-huh. Where'd you get it? Hey, let go. Hey, please, let me go, will you? Where'd you get it? At the same store you showed me. Hey, please, let me hurt me. Please. I ought to kill you, boy. I ought to beat your brains out. No, please. You could have brought the cops here. You know that. There were no cops. I look good. Huh? Honest. Let go, Slim. Huh? No cops? I'm positive. I didn't see anybody. Huh. Well, as long as you didn't see no cops, I guess there be no cops coming here, sure, huh? Sure. Everything's okay. Yeah. You didn't listen to me, Joey. Hey. I kill people who don't pay no attention. Ah, uh, Slim, don't do nothing. Come here, you miserable... No, I didn't mean nothing. Didn't mean nothing now. Oh, please. 
Police officers, you're under arrest. Huh? Me? Please, I didn't do nothing. He was trying to kill me. We'll see about that, son. Come on, both of you. Mm. Watch all your pulling. Come on, you. Okay, kid. Let's go. No, I don't want to go to jail. Come on, boy. It's just another lesson. It should have been the first lesson. It should have been the first. So, Don, that was the end of the teacher of crime. And Usri, who thought he had committed a perfect murder, made the worst mistake of all. He told someone about it. And the boy, Joey, told the police. In the Little Rock jail, William Usri confessed the murder of his sister, Etta. Usri was returned to Mississippi, where he died in the electric chair in the Forest County Jail a few months ago. Well, congratulations, Chief Pitcock, to you and to the men of the Little Rock Police Department who solved this terrible crime. Principal roles in tonight's dramatization were played by Bill Smith and Jack Grimes. Don Gardner speaking. Gangbusters is a Phillips H. Lord production. And now, in cooperation with police and federal law enforcement departments throughout the United States, Waterman's Pens and Waterman's Inc. present Gangbusters. <laughs> of the foxholes of Europe, from the steaming jungle swamps of the Pacific, our men are now coming home to a new America. A wave of crime has followed every war, and we must not allow lawbreakers to tear down here at home the very ideals that our men have fought to preserve. Tonight, gangbusters present the authentic inside facts concerning a killer who felt he was even too tough for the army. And so, Louis J. Valentine, who has just resigned as commissioner of the largest police department in the world, takes over to interview by proxy Chief A.S. Harper, chief of police of Amarillo, Texas. Commissioner Valentine. Chief Harper, I believe that one of the surest ways to combat crime is to expose it. Now we would like to have you rip this case wide open tonight. Well, Commissioner Valentine... I'd like to start back in October 1942 at 10.30 in the evening. A small-time gangster, Doc Rickett, was sitting with his girlfriend in a fashionable Cincinnati nightclub. You're a snappy-looking number tonight, Cora. You like this dress, huh? Yeah, it fits you like a glove. You're the... Hey, what are you staring at? Huh? What are you staring at? It's a big red-headed man over there. Any objections? Plenty. You're my girlfriend. <laughs> the redhead doesn't think so. He's smiling. Why, right, that's... Hey. Don't pay any attention to him, Cora. Why not? That's Red Beaver. Red Beaver? He's dynamite. The FBI and Secret Service have sent out coast-to-coast alarms. Beaver's a deserter from the Army. He's the quickest trigger man I know of. He only pulls the biggest jobs there are. Thanks, Rickett. I thought he was interesting. Now I'm sure. Now you've done it. He's coming over. You cross him and you get a bullet through your head. And you thought you were a big shot. I bet there are a million girls who wish they were in my place right now. He's sharp. Hello, pretty ladies. How about a little dance? Lay off, Beaver. She's my girl. So you know who I am, I reckon? Sure. I I spotted your red hair. I'm no Sunday school teacher myself. I blow around. How'd you know my name? When I spotted good looking here, I asked a few questions about who she was with. What's your take, Sugar? Cora. Cora Weston. Hmm. You've got what it takes, Cora. Move over, I'll sit down. I told you, Peter. Cora is my girl. Sure, sure, I had you. You know, Rickett, I think I could use you. Maybe put you up in the big dough. Yeah? Yeah, I could use a smart guy right now in my business. What kind of business, Peter? <laughs> the entertainment business. Yeah? Sure, I like to entertain. Let's see, we'll uh, 
start with a little Halloween party. A Halloween party? Where? In the Avondale branch of the Second National Bank. Oh, I get it. Uh-huh. <laughs> Halloween. You know, sweep the bank clean with the witch's broom. Suppose you take a walk for a couple of minutes, Rickard. I... I want a little board of directors meeting here with Cora. Well, I... Graham. Okay. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll get a drink at the bar, and then I'll be back. Smooth, honey. You're plenty smooth. You're kind of sugar-coated yourself, Stephen. <laughs> Believe in holidays, Cora? Yeah, I guess so. Why? Today's Columbus Day. Remember, Columbus discovered America and moved in. So? So I'm taking a tip from him. I just discovered you, so I'm going to do like him. Move in. Bad, Cora. Sit in your apartment. You playing to me. Want me to fix your cocktail, Beaver? <laughs> After two weeks, you have to ask me. I'll answer. Oh, no, I'll do the answer. Hello? Oh, uh, is that you, Beaver? Sure, it's me. Well, uh, I haven't got anything to do. Suppose I drop up, huh? No. Cora's my girlfriend now, Richard. Oh, uh... Get your surprise package? Yeah, yeah. But a clown suit and a cowboy suit. What's the gag? Tomorrow's Halloween. You dress up fancy on Halloween, don't you? You ought to wear the clown suit, see? <laughs> Good gag, huh? Oh. Besides, the clientele at the bank will have a tough time describing a clown and a cowboy. I get it. Wait with me a while, Rickett, and you'll learn things. Two men in Halloween costumes. One dressed as a cowboy, one as a clown. You approach with caution. These men are heavily armed. That's all. Well, Agent Hurley, we put that warning on every teletype through the state. We at the FBI appreciate your cooperation, Captain Morse. The bandit's stunt of dressing in Halloween costumes was a touch of genius. Nobody can seem to identify them. But I've always noticed that when a man gets money easily, he spends it easily. So, as just one possible trap, I sent out an alert to nightclubs, bars, racetracks, and pool rooms to watch for men who seem to be spending money too freely. Good. Perfect. I never guess they're spending a little too much money is what we're waiting for. Like this nightclub, Cora? We've sure been covering them all, haven't we, Red? <laughs> That's me, Cora. Everything in a big way. Yeah, but Red, you've been cracking so many banks. Every day, headlines in the papers. <laughs> Rick is so scared, he doesn't even dare leave our head out. He's pretty jealous, you know, Red. You taking me away from him. You leave Rick to me. Baby, I've got the biggest job yet lined up. A hundred thousand. Yeah? When? Christmas. At Christmas time, everybody gives presents. I figure maybe the uh, Charleston Trust don't want to give us a present. Why do you always pick a holiday, Red? <laughs> Holidays are made for guys like me. On holidays, the suckers stuff up with turkey and guzzle booze, right? They get slow and careless. Gee, I never thought of that. Booze makes them slip up. They're not themselves. Uh, uh, waiter. Oh, yes, sir. Waiter, bring another bottle of that champagne over here. I'm coming up, sir. You're spending your money awful fast tonight, Red. That's the way I make it, isn't it? Banks have lots of money, you know. Yeah, but you've been drinking a lot. You said tonight. When the man was drinking, he wasn't himself. That's for other guys, not me. You couldn't tell by the way I talk I've had a drink. Here you are, sir. Impulsive champagne. You know, someday I'm going to take a bath in that stuff. <laughs> I wouldn't do that, sir. The bubbles are tickle. <laughs> Quick on the trigger, ain't he? Pour it. Certainly, sir. Uh, 
anything else, sir? No. Ed, buy yourself a house for Christmas. Ed, take it. Thank you, sir. Yes, uh, thank you, sir. Thank you. You blown your top, Beaver. Giving that guy a century for a tip? Shut up and drink your champagne. Dames will crab all the time get on my nerves. You couldn't just slip the weight of the hundred. Oh, no, not you. You had to make a production of it. I said shut up. First thing you know, you... Don't hold your foot in that loose slip of yours or I'll slap you again. Now you've done it, you fool. That army sergeant saw you slap me. Oh, yeah? I eat army sergeants on toast. Oh, he's going to use that for an excuse to come over and meet you, huh? Gonna just win like I did to get you away from Rickett. <laughs> What's the matter? Something wrong? What's it to you? Can I do anything for you, miss? No. No. Everything's all right. Hey. What was you figuring on doing, Chum, if it hadn't been all right? Ah, take it easy, buddy. You've been celebrating a little too much. I suppose because you're in the army, you figure maybe I'm easy pickings, huh? Ah, uh, look, I don't want any trouble as long as the young lady says she's all right. Okay, I'm leaving. Oh, so you're going to pull up Prince Charming stuff, huh? Put that gun away. This time, Sergeant, you ran into a tough customer. Oh, if you're so tough, why don't you join the army? We need some good fighters. Oh, the army, huh? I don't see you being so brave. And besides, I don't like the looks of an army uniform. <laughs> me. we got to get out of here. Hey, how long are we going to stay holed up here in Chorus Flat, Beaver? As long as I say so, Rickard. Stop playing that piano, Chorus. Sit down, Beaver. You're driving us nuts with that walk. Shut up. If it wasn't for your nagging, this wouldn't have happened. Can you beat that? Red gets a snoop full, blows his top, shoots an army sergeant, then tries to pin the rap on me. You hadn't ought to be so quick with that rod, Beaver. You gonna start telling me how to operate? Oh, no, it ain't Killing that. comes pretty easy to me, Rickard. I'd remember that if I were you. The same goes for you, Carl. Huh? Now, what's that? It ain't a woodpecker. See what it is, Carl. Open up in there. Cops. Stall them. Give us a chance to get out the back window onto the fire escape. If it's the cops, I'll blast them from there. Open up or we'll break in the door. Take your time, boys. Take your time. Okay. What you selling? I'm Captain Moss of the Cincinnati Detectives. Mr. Hurley's a federal agent. So what? We're looking for a man who was seen coming into this building. Why well, pick on me? Every man who comes in this building don't come up here, unfortunately. Got the comedy. We know he's here. Step aside. Hold it, copper. I'm old-fashioned. I don't let strange men into my apartment unless they've got search warrants. Really? Yeah. And that goes double for coppers. Well, by an odd coincidence, I happen to have a search warrant. Right here. Well... If you must come in... What was that? Come on. Come back from that fire escape into the room again. With your arms up. We guessed if we came in the door, you gentlemen might go out the window, so I had a few of my men out there. Smart guy, huh? I know one of them, Captain Morris Rickett. Rickett's an old-time gangster. The redhead's a new one. I'm just an innocent bystander. The redhead is the one who shot the army sergeant. You got nothing on me, Captain. No. We had all of the nightclubs tipped off to report men who were spending money too freely. The waiter who waited on your table called us up. We examined the hundred dollar bill you gave him as a tip. I want to see my lawyer. I don't blame you, Red. Suppose we go down to headquarters for a talk. And, uh, if I say no? Well, if you should say no, I'll tell you. You'd come along a good deal like this. Let go of me, Papa. Let go. Let go. Will you? So Red Beaver started moving fast, Chief, Hop Chief Hopper. Yes, Commissioner. Red Beaver didn't know what had struck him till he was safe behind bars. But the crime history of Red Beaver had not yet reached its peak. Tonight marks the first broadcast in this L.E. Waterman Company presentation of Gangbusters. And we're proud to have been able to select as chief investigator and commentator for these programs a man who has been a police officer for almost half a century. 
and who last midnight resigned after 11 years as police commissioner of the New York City Police Department. Louis J. Valentine, as head of the largest police force in the world, has made contacts with and influenced police procedure on a nationwide scale. Federal, state, and local police departments throughout the country know and respect Commissioner Valentine as being in the forefront of our constant war against crime. Gangbusters and the L.E. Waterman Company are proud that Commissioner Louis J. Valentine will act as chief investigator on these factual cases. Well, Commissioner Valentine, how does it feel to be facing a microphone? Frankly, Mr. Gardner, it's harder to face than a gangster with a gun. But the L.E. Waterman Company has provided me with an opportunity to do something I've wanted to do for a long time. To me, gangbusters, which names names and states facts, is the ideal way to prove the folly of crime to those who might otherwise be led astray. And it's going to be my purpose to see that every program is pointed to bring about a better, safer, happy America for all. Thank you, Commissioner. And now, in recognition of your never-ending fight against crime, the L.E. Waterman Company makes the year's first network presentation of its Waterman's Deluxe Pen and Pencil gift set to you, Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Gardner. It certainly is beautiful. But I already have a Waterman set, one that was presented to me when I became a captain of police in this department 19 years ago. And I'd rather miss one of Mrs. Valentine's home meals than lose that set. Well, Commissioner, I don't blame you. But we do want you to have this newest model Waterman's. Thanks, Mr. Gardner. I accept it gratefully. And I'll use them both. And now, Commissioner Valentine, back to the case of Red Beaver. Chief Hopper, Red Beaver was in the Cincinnati prison. Yes, Commissioner Valentine. And it was 16 minutes before 9 on the evening of February 12th. Red Beaver lay sprawled in his bunk, watching water pouring from his wash basin to the cell floor. Finally, he walked over to the bars separating him from Doc Ricketts' cell. Hi, Ricky. Where's all the water coming from, Beaver? <laughs> I told you we'd break out of this joint. But if it's all the same to you, I'd rather walk out than swim out. Know what day today is, Ricky? Sure. February 12th, so what? February 12th. Lincoln's birthday. What do you want we should do? Eat birthday cake? Yeah. You never heard what Lincoln did? He got himself shot. Is that what you're aiming for us to get? Yeah, but before he did, he uh, freed the slaves. So? Today's Lincoln's birthday, so we'll do like him. We'll uh, free the slaves. Us included. Just like that, huh? How? Close up your base and let the water run on the floor. Why? Yours is running plenty. You're going to start raising fish in there? Like I say. Okay, okay. Good. Now we'll wait a minute and we call a guard. Then what? We yell for a dry cell. While we're switching, we hit him over the head and make a break. How's the water coming? You could launch a ship in here now. Okay. Land the cup. God! God! Help! Help! Hey, We're God. being flooded! Get it! Run! Run! Get it! Run! Run! Just held up the Second National Bank and are escaping. Green, 1940, Chrysler Sedan. License number 293-348. That is all. To Kansas City Police. To Kansas City Police. Relief killer Red Beaver and pal Rickett are driving toward Kansas City. These men are heavily armed. Suggest roadblock. I can't stand this strain much longer, Beaver. I'm cracking. Don't worry. We'll be all right here in Kansas City. The whole country's looking for us. (laughs) 
I always do things in a big way, Rickett. But I tell you, Kansas City's safe. I got it all figured out. Roadblock up ahead. Where those rotten coppers are. Coppers all over the place. I'll run over them. I'll kill them. Hold on. Come on. I'm all in. Oh, it's what's going on for days. This cop shooting at us. Kansas City, FBI Washington. Doc Rickett, companion of Red Beaver, was found hiding in cellar in Kansas City. Rickett is now under arrest. Red Beaver escaped and is believed hiding in one of the southern states. Hello? Hello, Edwards? Oh. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure, this is Edwards. Is that you, Helen? Sure. Yeah, wait a minute, let me sit down, huh? You tired? I'm just not used to this Texas weather yet. Mm-hmm. How do you like it here in Amarillo? Well, that depends upon how well you like me, baby. <laughs> but I haven't seen you very often. I'll see you tonight. All right. Yeah, we'll go to a club. At... Wait a minute. What's the matter? Hold it. Can you beat that? Huh? <laughs> What's the matter? <laughs> Two women out in the street. They bump cars. <laughs> Are they mad? Uh-oh. But the little one's shoving the big one around. No, no, the big one, she won't take it. Wow. <laughs> what happened? The little one gives the big one a slap. Uh-oh, the cop's seen him. Hey, this is a grandstand seat. <laughs> hey, they're looking up here at the window. They can see me laughing at them. <laughs> so you're as good as a radio fight announcer. Uh, the cop's walking across the sidewalk toward my window here. Uh, this is a laugh. Why? If you only knew, sister. Hey, mister, you saw these two women bump cars, didn't you? Sure, I seen them, officer. I was looking right out the window here. Uh, which one was at fault? Ah, uh, no, you don't. You don't get me between two dames, especially those dames. If one of them was cute, it might be different. Hello? Hello? Uh, wait a minute, baby. I'm talking to the cop here. Well, I guess I have to take him up to the station house. Will you uh, come up with me and tell what you saw? No, wait a minute. I'm not going... Uh... Okay. <laughs> okay, sure, I'll go with you. I'd be much obliged if you would. Sure, sure, I will. Uh, hello, Sugar. I'll call you back later. All right, Edward. I gotta go see justice done. Well, copper, lead the way. I'll put on my hat and be right with you. Now, this is the gentleman I was telling you about, Captain Kirkman. He was sitting in the window and saw the two women bump fenders. Oh, I appreciate your coming up to the station, huh? That's all right. Uh, what's your name? Jack Edwards. Oh, I'm Captain Kirkman, and this is Captain King. I'm glad to meet you. Oh, uh, sit down, Mr. Uh, Edwards. Mm-hmm. Ah, you've got a pretty good police station here at Amarillo, haven't you? Oh, it serves its purpose. You a stranger in Amarillo? I've been here a couple of months. Uh, you want me to tell you about those two women bumping cars, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yes, but you don't happen to know a man by the name of Red Beaver, do you? Uh, who? Red Beaver. He's an escaped convict and a killer. No, I never heard of him. What do you ask me? I was just wondering, Red, that's all. You call me Red? My name ain't Red. It's Jack. Jack Edwards. Oh, I see. Here. There's a wanted circular for Red Beaver for desertion from the Army and killing an Army sergeant. No, I don't know what you're talking Detectives about. Detectives standing back to you all have their guns out, Red. No, no, no I, I didn't kill nobody. It wasn't me. I, I didn't kill him. I... Uh, what a sucker I am. Yes, you are. All police officers have been on the lookout for you. You me ending up here. For them two dames to bump their cars, I could bump them off. Didn't figure it might be a little plan to get you up here without any shooting. And I thought I was smart. Me, me, Red Beaver, being took in by this one-horse joint. I didn't kill that guy, though. We'll leave that to the United States Army, Beaver. They're asking for you. No, 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 look, I, I, I'll do anything. I'll tell you anything you want to know, but don't let the Army get a hold of me. Don't, 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 don't let the Army get a hold of me, please. Oh. Harry Red Beaver, as convicted by a court martial at Fort Sill, you will, on this morning of September 26, 1944, be hanged by the neck until dead. Harry Beaver, have you anything to say? 
Now, now I just ain't got nothing. May God rest your soul. And Commissioner Valentine, at 6.37 a.m., 20 minutes later, Harry Red Beaver was dead, executed by the United States Army. Chief Hopper, this has been a terrific case tonight, one I doubt that we will ever forget. I wish that every person in this country might have heard it. Yes, Commissioner Valentine, to Red Beaver, the men in the uniform of their country were suckers. He knew better. He knew how to get easy money. But it didn't turn out that way. And it never does. And now, before we present our urgent last-minute bulletins on persons wanted by the authorities at this very moment, the case of Red Beaver is over. But the case of the missing words remains a mystery to millions of Americans. Their only clue is the peculiar behavior of a fountain pen, a pen that sometimes writes on and on without ever seeming to run dry. And then again, it seems out of ink almost before it starts. The reason is that, in the first instance, the pen was filled with Waterman's wonderful blue-black ink and thus gave thousands of extra words. The second time, however, a different ink had been used and fewer words resulted. This tremendous difference, ladies and gentlemen, is because Waterman's blue-black is all ink, true ink. No solvents, no added chemicals, no dilution. That's why, by actual test, Waterman's blue-black ink gives you up to 6,500 more words per filling. Think of it. Up to 6,500 more words per filling than other inks tested. Now you can cut those messy pen-filling chores perhaps in half. Now you can write steadily for hour after hour after hour without pausing to refill your pen. And all you have to do is to make every filling a Waterman's filling. Yes, you can solve your own case of the missing words forever with Waterman's blue-black ink. And remember, Waterman's ink is also available in seven other pleasing and distinctive colors. All come in the convenient tip-fill bottle. Each, only ten cents. Now, gangbusters nationwide clues. Chief R.F. Worstner, Dayton, Ohio Police Department, announces a reward of $8,500 is being offered for return of two-and-a-half-year-old baby Ronald Thompson and conviction of his kidnapper. Here is description given gangbusters by Dayton police of alleged kidnapper. Woman known as Mary Wilkie, 40 to 45 years old, 5 feet 6 inches, about 150 pounds, Ruddy complexion, reddish brown hair, believed henna, brushed back and up, speaks with slight accent, possibly southern or eastern, pleasing personality, renew vigilance for this woman, reward now offered by Dayton, Ohio police, $8,500. From Denver, Colorado Police, urgent bulletin concerning suspect wanted for questioning in connection with murder of J.A. Richardson, that city. Suspect described as follows. Andrew Cypress, alias Jack Wood, alias William Hammond, 36, 5 feet 6 inches, about 150 pounds, dark hair, brown eyes, when last seen, according to police, wore a khaki shirt or jacket with blood stain on right shoulder and sleeve, where he supposedly was shot in struggle with victim... Suspect believed to have left scene of crime in company of woman in green Pontiac sedan, bearing Los Angeles license ending in numerals 8-0. Watch for Andrew Cyphers. Wanted for questioning. Murder. Denver Police Department. If you have any information concerning these clues, notify your local police, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, or gangbusters at once. Now, here is Commissioner Valentine. Next week, gangbusters will present the case of the red evening dress. It's about a girl and her love for a killer. Remember, next week, same time, same station, one of the most unusual cases gangbusters has ever presented. In the meantime, when you are buying a fountain pen or when you're buying ink, just look for the name... 
Waterman. <coughs> Gangbusters Factual Case Histories is a Phillips H. Lord production. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. And now, in cooperation with police and federal law enforcement departments throughout the United States, Waterman's Pens and Waterman's Inc. present Gangbusters! Out of the foxholes of Europe, from the steaming jungle swamps of the Pacific, our men are now coming home to a new America. A wave of crime has followed every war, and we must not allow lawbreakers to tear down here at home the very ideals that our men have fought to preserve. Tonight, Gangbusters presents the authentic inside facts about a gun mall who wanted a red dress more than anything else in the world. And so, Louis J. Valentine, former commissioner of the largest police department in the world, takes over to interview by proxy Sheriff E. W. Biscaylus of Los Angeles County, California. Commissioner Valentine. Sheriff Biscaylus, I know you want to start tonight's case from inside San Quentin Prison. Uh, yes, Commissioner Valentine. San Quentin is one of our largest and oldest penitentiaries. With steel and concrete walls 18 feet high and 3 feet thick at the bottom. They're impossible to undermine. And guards constantly patrol the top of the walls. How many killers and criminals are there in San Quentin, Sheriff? Some 3,500, Commissioner Valentine. Or there were on the first Saturday afternoon of last October 1944. When a prisoner knocked on the door of the warden's office. Come in. Oh, yes, Connors? Uh, there's a girl in the waiting room, Warden. She a beauty. She's sweet and young and fresh. Oh, uh, that must be Miss Nelson from the Red Cross to pick up my donation. I tell her to come right in, Connors. Okay. Uh, Miss, uh, would you come in and see the warden, please? Uh, won't you come over and sit down? I uh, didn't expect you so soon. I'll have the Red Cross check made out in just a moment. Red Cross check? Why, yes. I don't understand. Aren't you Miss Nelson from the Red Cross? No. Oh, I see. Who are you? Juanita Hanson. Oh, I'm sorry, Miss Hanson. I, I was mistaken. I was waiting for William Crane to be released. William Crane? Yes. Why? You, uh, related to Crane? I'm his girlfriend. In just a moment, please. Warden speaking. William Crane is in the outer office, sir. Ready to be released. Hmm. All right, Connor, send him in. Are you really William Crane's girlfriend? Why not? Well, William Crane is one of the toughest, most dangerous criminals in San Quentin. But he's being released. Yes, he served his time for the crime he was convicted of, but... I've been waiting five years for it. Miss Hanson, you, you've only one life. You're young, beautiful. Your whole life is before you. I'd think it over if I were you. Hello, Warden. Oh, uh, come in, Crane. Hi, kid. Hello, Crane. Well, Warden, looks like this is where you and me part company. Crane, I hope I don't see you here again. Remember this. Hard work never hurt anybody. <laughs> That's what the Warden at Joliet told me before they turned me loose. I see. Well, good luck then. No, I ain't shaking hands with you, Warden. You've got a good girl there, Crane. Think it over. The sermon through? Yes, it's through. 
Come on, kid. Let's blow. Crane, can you imagine that warden calling me a good girl? <laughs> what do you got fixed, Juanita? If this cab driver doesn't fall asleep, we should be there in half an hour. It's a place at Cobblestone Cabin, just north of Bakersfield. Shaky O'Leary's out of the jug. He's up there waiting. Okay. Things are going to start popping and popping fast. Your dame done okay, Crane. We're going to be healed right with this artillery she got for us. Let's see that thirty-eight, Shaky. You can have the thirty-eight. Give me the sawed-off shotgun every time. There's a swell hideout, huh, Crane? Yeah, we need it did all right. Imagine her putting up white lace curtains. <laughs> well, good looking herself. You got us some good rods here, Juanita. Well, what's eating you? There's going to be a new deal in this gang, boys. What new deal? What do you mean, Juanita? This time, you're doing as I say. What? I'm laying the plan. Oh, no, there ain't no woman telling me what to do. I've been in this game too long. And you ended up in San Quentin, Shaky. And Crane... Now, wait a minute. I've been waiting five years, Crane. I'm young. I've got a right to live and be happy. Have money, attention, good clothes. I haven't gone places. I've been waiting for you to get out of the penitentiary. Well, now you're out. I want the things I've been dreaming of. You both tried your ways and the cops got you, put you behind bars. But not this time. I've got everything planned. We'll have everything, but no more penitentiaries. I don't know, but maybe she's got something, Shaky. Well, maybe. Maybe. It's a new deal, boys. A new deal. From now on. To all cruising police cars, Farmington Hotel... 3974 Wilshire Boulevard, just robbed by two gunmen and beautiful girl. Man just held up by two gunmen at 1516 Sunset Boulevard. Third hold up by these gunmen today. Emergency. Grocer on Breed Avenue just held up at gunpoint. Large sum of money taken. Girl driving black sedan. Warning. These gunmen are heavily armed. What are you pulling up here for, Juanita? I've got another job lined up across the street. Hey, not bad. The bank over there. Got it all cased, huh? Well, uh, no, not exactly. You can't knock over a bank, kid, unless you've cased it. Know how everything is. But it's not the bank. Not the bank? Huh? But there's no other place over there. Just that little cleaning store. I know. That that's the place I've got picked out for it. What? You nuts? You're not figuring for us to take over that little joint, one either. Crane, you, you don't understand good planning. You see, you all need different clothes. The cops are giving out descriptions of what you're wearing. Now, you can't go out and buy clothes you'd be recognized. Yeah, but a cleaning store. This time, Juanita, no. But you've got to. You've got to. What is this, anyhow? For my sake, you've got to, please. What's back of all this? Why have we got to crack that cleaning store? I... Come on, why have we? I told you, Crane. I've been wanting clothes all these years I've been waiting for you. Now, I can't get out and buy any. I'd be recognized. In the window of the cleaning shop, there's a red evening dress. It's the most beautiful evening dress I ever saw. I've never had an evening dress. I've always wanted one. Red. Just like that one. Oh, please. Please, I've waited so long. I want that red dress. Can you beat that? All right, kid. We'll crack the cleaning store. We'll get us some different clothes and maybe the red dress. Come on, Shaky. Over to the cleaning store. We'll let money to have it. There, we sure brought back a mess of clothes from that cleaning store. Oh, there's the red evening dress at the bottom of the pile. Hold on, will you? We're getting to it. 
Take a look at Shaky in that soup and fish. <laughs> oh, please, please, I want to see the dress. Okay, okay, I'll pull it out. Oh, Cray, look at this. Oh, it's the most beautiful gown I ever saw in my life. All right, now shut up, will you? Oh, I love you all. It's beautiful. It's what I always dreamed of. Don't let Dan skin your life. Oh, Cray. Lay off, will you? <laughs> I'm going into the other room and get all dressed up. Then you've got to... You can take... Oh. Oh, look. Look. Will you stop? Look. All the way down the back, it's torn. I can't wear it. It's not... Oh, shut up. You're getting me down. <laughs> no, I've got it, but it's no good. I just want what other people have. But nothing ever turns out right for me. <laughs> Listen, Queen, I've been wanting to talk to you about Juanita. Yeah? She has too much to say around here. I know what I'm doing, Shiggy. When I want your advice, I'll ask for it. A slug between her eyes is what she needs. I said I know what I'm doing. Juanita's tired. She's on edge. I'll handle her all right. Okay. Just don't wait too long. I got my plan, Shiggy. Don't worry. As long as Juanita's helping us, she stays around. Telling you, Queen, a roadside stand like this, it's nothing but peanuts. Juanita's put her finger on a bankroll here. He's that tall man at the far table. A big time gambler from Denver. He's got a roll of three or four thousand. Says who? I sent her out alone last night. She lamped him. I'll go out and have the car running. Yeah, look at your dame, Queen. She's got the jitters worse than ever. Never mind that. Okay, this is it. All right, folks, this is a stick up. Reach. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Pipe down, old man. What do you mean? I said pipe down. What is it? Yeah, I hear. Get out of the way, you. No. I said get out of the way. No. Maybe you didn't see this rod. Yeah, I see it. You can't bluff me. Duck, boss, that sugar ball, he's thrown it. Well, you little. You're in sleep. Oh. Make for the car, pal. Get going, Juanita. I just bumped a guy. You killed him? No. No, don't say you killed him. Get going, will you? When I got a gun, no guy is going to stand up to me. Remember that. Crane made his getaway, Sheriff Fisk Kalouz. Yes, Commissioner Valentine. He literally was riding at the crest. But something which Crane hadn't counted on soon took place. And now, Commissioner Valentine, I'd like to ask you a question. Isn't it true that one of the hardest things a police officer has to learn is to spot the difference between the guilty and the innocent, between the false and the genuine? That's right, Mr. Gardner. But modern scientific research and equipment have made it a lot easier to tell the difference. Yes, friends, and modern research methods have also made it easy to prove the difference between one ink and another, to prove a difference that is truly amazing. For example, recent tests of nationally known inks show that Waterman's Blue Black gives you up to 6,500 extra words every time you fill your pen. Think of it. Up to 6,500 more words per filling than any other nationally known ink. That means you save all the muss and bother of frequent refilling. You save time, money, and that annoying loss of thought continuity. That's fine, Mr. Gardner. But what makes such a big difference? Well, simple enough, Commissioner. It's because Waterman's Blue Black Ink is all ink. No solvents, no dilution, no added chemicals. Every drop is packed with true ink quality, the kind that writes on and on and on. And because it's all ink, Waterman's Blue Black is second to none in resistance to air, light, time, and moisture. Suitable for all types of pens, for all kinds of paper. Leaves no blurry lines, has no unpleasant odors. So switch to Waterman's Blue Black and get just what you ask for, ink. Remember, too... That Waterman's ink comes in seven other pleasing and distinctive colors, all in the amazingly convenient tip-fill bottle. 
Only ten cents. And now, back to tonight's case of William Harlan Crane and Commissioner Louis J. Valentine. Sheriff Biscay Luz with William Harlan Crane shooting a man and apparently riding high and wide. What was the next development in this case? Well, it was the day after the shooting, Commissioner Valentine. A woman was sitting in a chair. The spotlight was on her face. Her whole body trembled. And she nervously clasped and unclasped her hands. Finally, she turned to the man who was quietly watching her. Tell me, Doctor. What is it? Young lady, you're in bad shape. Your whole nervous system. You're burned out. What'll I do? You must have lived a pretty, well, unusual life. Yes. Yes, I have. Whom do you live with? Uh... Why, why, just some people. That bruise on your face. Oh, it's nothing. It's nothing. Do you have a boyfriend? Uh, y- yes. Young lady, I know more about you than you think I do. What do you mean? I thought so. Well, I'm going to give you some tablets for your nerves. I've got to have something. One of these tablets will put you to sleep, fast asleep. Take only one at a time. I'm giving you five extra ones, but don't use them unless you have to. Thank you, Doctor. When you get home, take one and hide the others so no one can get to them accidentally. Improperly taken, the tablets can be dangerous. Yes, sir. And thank you, doctor. Thank you. And you won't tell anyone I was here, will you? No. Now, young lady, you've got to learn to relax. Take things easier. A lot easier. I've never even been on the pier here at Long Beach before, Crane. Keep walking, Juanita. Right out to the end of the pier. Everybody seems so happy, laughing and everything. I'm not hearing any laughing matter. Keep walking. I guess those two over there are in love, aren't they? Mm Mm-hmm. I wonder what makes them so happy. I'm nuts, I guess. We've passed everything now. There's nothing way out at the end of the pier, Crane. Keep walking. What are we coming out here for? I'll tell you when we get there. Come on over here by the rail. Now lean over the rail. Put your arm around me. Crane, you mean it? Sure, I mean it. Oh. Look. Look at the moon. I see it. And the water. Come closer. Yes. I've... I've got a confession to make, Crane. Hmm? What's that? I was afraid, afraid as I was walking out here with you, you, well, you might hate me and want me out of the way. You're not. Come closer. Yes. Now lean over. Yes. What was that? That's why I wanted you close, like we were making love. I didn't tell you we had a little trouble in that liquor store job tonight. Oh. What did you drop in the water? The gun I killed the guy with. Oh. It's 35 feet deep out here off the pier. So... So that was why you wanted me to be close to you. To make love to you. So people couldn't see you drop the murder gun. You're getting bright, aren't you? Come on, we'll leave him. Come on. Just a few minutes. I said we're leaving. The cops are closing up California tight in a drum. State police, federal guys, hundreds of them. We're going back to the hideout and figure a way of getting out. (laughs) 
I'm going nuts, I tell you. Crane nuts. This, this hideout's bad as a cell. Stop blowing your top, Shaggy. You've got to listen to the short wave and hear what the cops are doing. Police control cars, attention. This is Lloyd Smith, night dispatcher. You are to act upon the orders of Captain C.W. Ellison. Have your guns ready and patrol all highways. The men we are after are killers. Yeah, they don't know where to look. Deputy Sheriffs Thompson, Rayner, Murphy. Proceed to cobblestone cabins with riot guns and tear gas bombs. Run to our cabin, Hyder. We can't beat it for that. Crane, I can't take it. We're like rats in a trap. Who's that? I'll kill you. Shut I'll up. I'll kill... It's the only one either. What's the latest police report? You got it trapped in, all right. It's your fault, Juanita. We're in this jam. Shut up, will you, Shaggy? Juanita, I saw that box you had the sleeping pills in the doctor gave you. It was on a washboard. Yes. It was empty. Yes, the doctor said they'd be good for my nerves. All of them at one time? Yes, that's the way I was supposed to take them. Huh. They were all different kinds, and I had to take them all together for them to do any good. KQBV, KQBV. Hey, that's a secret code. They're going to ring. KQBV. Answer your call letters, please. KQBV. Those are just the call letters of the police radio. It's like we were rats being trapped. I think I know how to help you, boys. You keep your nose out of it. enough for you, Juanita. Well, I think I can call the cops off you. What do you mean? You and Shaky get in the car. Start driving toward San Fernando. Hmm? Fifteen minutes after you've left, I'll call the cops. And tell them there's been a killing on the other side of town. I'll describe you two, and all the cops will go racing in the wrong direction. Yeah? Yeah? What are you willing to do that for? If you stay here, you'll get caught. I can slip through alone and meet you next week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know, maybe that's a good idea. Yeah, it's the best idea we got, sure. Wait a minute. How come you're willing to take this chance, Juanita? Crane is my boyfriend. Aren't you, Crane? Sure, baby, sure. You know I love you. Then why shouldn't I take a chance? Come on, Shaky. We gotta get going. Yeah. I'll sit down here by the telephone, and in 15 minutes, I'll call the cops. Hey, uh... I ain't getting sleepy, are you, kid? No. No, I'm not getting sleepy, Crane. Okay. Oh, we're leaving. Good luck. You, uh... You want to give me a kiss... Before you go, Cream? None of that stuff now, kid. The time's too short. Yes. The time's too short. Come on, Shaky. Get going. I'll be seeing you, Juanita. Yes. I'll be seeing you. Will you pass that car in front of us, Crane? We've been trailing at 20 miles. It's doing 40, Shaky. I don't want to take a chance of being picked up for speed. No cop's going to take me. I'll blow my brains out first. Cars 47 and 2. That's state police. Be ready for instructions. You suppose the cops will get Juanita back there? Sure they will. You can't tell nothing. You should have pumped a full of lead weeks Attention. ago. Attention. Attention, all police. Is there anybody living but police? The body of a girl has just been found in a house on the outskirts of Long Beach. Juanita, she's dead. This girl was sitting by the telephone... Death was due to the overdose of sleeping tablets. Juanita's dead, and she's here in the air. Examination of the house leaves no doubt, but it was occupied by the gunman. Cartridges were found, and fingerprints of Shaggy O'Leary. And it's me. And the prints of William Harlan Crane. That is all. Crane, she's dead. Stop shaking, yeah. will you? She, she knows how we wanted to kill her. She's laughing at it. Sure, that's what she's doing. She's laughing uh, at it. 42, calling headquarters. That sounds awful loud. I'm getting you, 42. I'm proceeding 40 miles an hour along Highway 19. That's where we are, Crane. We're directly back of Killer's car. Car 29 directly in front of them. We have them hemmed in. Crane, there is another car right in back of us. Break out that back window and use your shotgun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Shoot to kill him. Go on, shoot some more. I, I, I couldn't hold the shotgun. It dropped out the back window. You stupid fool. Start shooting with your rod, then. There's a roadblock up ahead. Now we are caught. All right, you men. Now that car with your hands up. Yeah, 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 yeah. We're, we're coming. We're coming. Don't shoot, cover. Don't shoot. Here's my rod. So you're a crane, huh? And the fellow doing the shakes must be O'Leary. I said, don't shoot, copper. I'm all in. Fight's all out of you, eh, crane? Yeah. Come on, get going. There's a couple of cells reserved for the both of you. 
Back in San Quentin. And that, Commissioner Valentine, is the factual case history of William Harlan Crane, Shaky O'Leary, and the beautiful Juanita Hansen. O'Leary was sentenced to life imprisonment. Tonight, Crane is in a cell, alone, sitting, thinking, listening to the clock ticking away the minutes before he is to be led into the gas chamber to his death. Thank you, Sheriff Fiscalese. All of us who listen to this case must realize again that crime does not pay. Commissioner, before broadcasting our last-minute police bulletins on persons wanted tonight, I'd like to say a word to Sheriff biscay Lewis. Sheriff biscay Lewis, it's a pleasure at this time to thank you and your fellow police officers for your splendid work as illustrated by tonight's case. In recognition of your courage and devotion to duty, Sheriff, please accept this Waterman's Deluxe Pen and Pencil gift set with your name engraved on the gold cap. Why, thank you, Mr. Gardner. That's a present I'll certainly be using for a long time to come. Now, to our radio listeners, we'd like to make a suggestion. Before you buy a fountain pen at any price, consider carefully its features. Does it have a hand-ground 14-carat gold point that exactly suits your writing style? Waterman's does. Then how does the ink feed compare with Waterman's exclusive Inquiduct feed? Is it marvelously responsive to every writing need? Well, Waterman's is. And what about filling? Is there bother with plungers or pumping instead of Waterman's remarkably simple and easy one-stroke filling? You see, it's the quality that's built into every part of a Waterman's pen which provides so many extra advantages, so much long-lasting satisfaction which makes it a pen you're always proud to own. Remember, too, it was Waterman's who invented the first practical fountain pen more than 60 years ago. Throughout the world, millions of satisfied users will tell you, for finest pen performance, just look for the name Waterman. And now, gangbusters nationwide clues. Richard H. G. Warden, Nevada State Prison, wires gangbusters that three convicts have escaped by overpowering a guard and making their getaway in a prison truck. The escaped convicts are described as... Leo Young, 23, 5 feet 8 inches, 160 pounds, red hair, hazel eyes, medium build, tattoo, word Leo, left forearm. Word Leo, left forearm. Escape, Earl Russo. 31, 5 feet 11 inches, 157 pounds, brown hair, light hazel eyes, two scars, left side of face, scar back of neck. Escaped William Russo, brother of Earl Russo, 33, 5 feet 10 inches, 152 pounds, brown hair, blue eyes, walks awkwardly. Watch for Leo Young, Earl Russo, and William Russo. Escape Nevada State Prison. If you have any information concerning these clues, notify your local police, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, or gangbusters at once. Now, here's Commissioner Valentine to tell you about next week's case. Our case next week concerns the magician of the prison cells. A gangster who laughs at steel locks, electric eyes, and listening devices. For the thrilling, authentic case history of this magician of the prison cells, listen next week, same time, same station, to Gangbusters. And anytime, anywhere, when you were buying a fountain pen, or when you're buying ink, just look for the name Waterman. Gangbusters Factual Case Histories is a Phillips H. Lord production. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Gangbusters! 
Gangbusters, presented in cooperation with police and federal law enforcement departments throughout the United States. The only national program that brings you authentic police case histories. Valentine, who has just resigned as commissioner of the largest police department in the world, takes over for gangbusters to interview by proxy Chief of Police Hans Halverson of Ray, North Dakota. Commissioner Valentine. Now, Chief Halverson, the official police reports show that John K. Giles was an exceptionally cunning criminal. And uh, deadly, Commissioner Valentine. So you're going to start tonight's case back at Leech Lake in Minnesota? Yes. There was a tall, wealthy sportsman, a Mr. George William Stubblefield. He had one of the fashionable cottages with a Mr. Barton. And they were there for some bass fishing. Now, in that same section was reported to be the super criminal John K. Giles, like lightning with a gun. At 10.30... In the evening of September 2nd, Mr. Stubblefield and Mr. Barton were in their cabin, alone, looking over their bass fishing equipment. I think I'll try my double spinner with a bucktail streamer tomorrow, Mr. Stubblefield. Yeah? Well, let me see it. The water is pretty warm in the lake, and I think the bass are down pretty deep. It's here somewhere. Uh, get those hands up. Both of you. Get those hands up or I'll shoot. Well, we have company. I know you're both rich and you're alone out here in this cabin. I guess he means it too, Mr. Stubblefield. Young man, don't you realize that crime doesn't pay? Uh, I don't want any sermons. I want cash. Well, it so happens we have our hands in the air. Very little money grows on ceilings. All right. You first. Me? Yeah, you. The name is Stubblefield. All right. Uh, lower your right hand and pick out everything there is in your pocket and drop it on the floor. It'll get all dirty. Do as I told you. All right. All right. But I only have a hundred or two in my pocket. There's some. And here's some more. I wouldn't try to pick that gun up. Don't you anymore. Hey, don't. Look. Look. My hand. I told you, young man, crime doesn't pay. The easiest thing to do, Stubb, would be to put a bullet through the back of his head and drop him into the lake. Hey, no, no. You can't do that. Hey, let me go, will you? Say, you don't suppose he's that famous gunman they say might be around this section? That John K. Giles? Oh, I doubt it. No. Hey, no. I'm not... Hey, I'm not Giles. Oh, I just pull little stuff. All right. I'm going to count to three. If you're still around... One, two, <laughs> streak of lightning. <laughs> oh, that's the best show I've had in weeks. If he only knew he tried to hold up the famous John K. Giles himself. Yeah, he ought to be wrapped in swaddling clothes. You know, Barton, the feel of this gun in my hands. Well, thank you. Yeah. The one I've been planning. The bank at Ray, North Dakota. But what's the matter with what we're doing now? Two wealthy fishermen, the bass are biting good. You've got three rich dames here crazy about you. <laughs> There's plenty of women and plenty of bass other places. Start packing up, Barton. This little gun, and you and me, are going to pay a visit to Ray, North Dakota. Yeah, I didn't figure this Ray, North Dakota, would be such a busy place, Charles. You ready? We'll take a little walk into the bank. Okay. Wait a minute. Don't huh? turn around. Somebody's walking up and back here. Who is it? Johnson, the chief of police. I checked on the police earlier this morning, and I'm sure. I saw you two men standing here. I was wondering if you wanted anything special. Well, that's nice of you. We're strangers in town. Huh? What's on your mind? Well, we heard there was some good bass fishing around. We could find a place to stay. Well, there are a couple of good hotels. Now, my name is Stubblefield. 
Hey, this is Mr. Barton. Howdy, Howard. I happen to be the chief here, Chief Johnson. Now, there's a good hotel right down the street. Where? Well, you go down there to the third street, and then you take a... He knew who we were all the time. He's not dead. Mm. Now, come on. Beat it to the car. Now, instead of this bank, I know a couple of other jobs we can pull. Then we'll separate until the heat's off. Up him. Hey, haven't you got any nerves at all, uh, now? Not at a time like this. Well, after we separate, what then? We'll meet again in Nevada. At Reno. Welcome to Reno. I missed you, Barton. Come on up. I'll be right there. Hmm. Hello? Don't you ever stay in your room? Oh, hello, Mrs. Lawson. I told you to call me Betty. I'm giving a cocktail party this afternoon. You've got to come. Well, I'd love to, but I'm playing golf with Mrs. Ward. Oh, that's a shame. It's getting so the divorcees around here won't go to a cocktail party if you aren't going to be there. <laughs> well, that's very flattering, but <laughs> I'll tell you what. I'll see you at the roulette table tonight. You will? Will you drive me home afterwards? Hey, what a swanky choice. Oh, somebody just come in? My butler. Oh, you lucky thing to have a butler. And now I'm one of them things. I remember. Tonight at the roulette table. Bye, my dear. I'll be there. Don't you dare forget. I won't. Goodbye. So now I'm your butler, huh? Oh, <laughs> sit down, Barton. Yeah, things have been pretty rosy since I saw you last. Really? What have you got lined up? About ten divorces for a relaxation. And the gambling casino for us to take over. Hmm. Say, how about a little first question, huh? Champagne? Oh, no, no, no. It gives me a head the next day unless I drink a lot of milk before I go to bed. And milk's making me fat. <laughs> a slug arrived. I got a whole closet full. I just got in the room myself as you called. Put your oh, hands up, Giles. You too, Barton. Well, police popping out a liquor closet? Police popping out of bathrooms? Any more under the bed? Put the cuffs on both of them. Yeah. Oh, oh, right. I a nice reception I get, Giles. Don't worry, Barton. We'll get a little rest for a few days. And we'll break out of whatever they put us into. Pretty cocky, aren't you, Giles? As cocky as you cops are lucky. No, it wasn't luck, Giles. After you killed Chief Johnson and Ray, North Dakota, you robbed the First National Bank of Genoa. Then you hired a private plane to bring you from Salt Lake City here to Reno. <laughs> well... Where do we go from here? You're going back to Iowa. You've escaped from every prison you ever put into, Giles. But you ever hear of the specially built Potawatomi prison? Hey, that's quite a name, isn't it? The Potawatomi... Pot... <laughs> oh, never mind. I'll be out of it before I can pronounce it. And so, Commissioner Valentine, cop killer and escape artist John K. Giles is headed for prison. But we've just started our case. Well, Chief Halverson, we certainly want to hear what happened next. Now, back to tonight's gangbusters case of John K. Giles and Commissioner Lewis J. Valentine. Now, Chief Halverson, cop killer John K. Giles was headed for prison. And Commissioner Valentine, Potawatomi Prison in Iowa was the last word in prison. Giles and Barton were being ushered through the prison corridor. Now, this will be your cell, Giles. And Barton. Quite an iron box, this, isn't it? You're quite an escape artist, Giles. That's why a special cell like this was built for guys like you. You see, it's built on a turntable made of steel. There's only one door to it. The floor is steel. 
Well, in fact, you might try it out with a hacksaw blade. I would, if we had one. Use the one you have hidden in the heel of your shoe. Oh. Hmm. Well, I guess they've got us this time, Charles. All right. Seeing you know I've got a hacksaw blade, I'll try it just for fun. When you go through a door and have metal on you, it signals. Doesn't bite in, does it, Giles? Quite amusing. Another thing, Giles. All we allow you is bunk blankets, overalls, and his living implements, toothbrushes, paper cups and plates, and wooden spoons. Oh, that's perfectly all right. That's enough for me to escape with. Oh, cut it out, will you, child? Now, if you two will step into your cell. What do you think of it, Giles? Well, personally, but of course, it's just my own opinion. I think it stinks. Speak and take it on the earphone while I take his call. Hello? How long before you come home, Walter? Well, I probably won't even be home tonight, dear. Oh, why not? Well, I'm in a little room in the basement under the special cell. We're determined that Giles isn't going to escape. But Giles is a de escape proof cell. He couldn't escape out of that cell. Well, this Giles is superhuman. We're not taking any chances. We've got a microphone hidden in the wall. And one of us stays down here by the speaker every second. Are they still plotting to escape? Giles can think up two new ways every ten minutes. We let them go ahead and then stop them just about as they start something. Walter. Hmm? The baby's got a new tooth. No kidding. That's what I wanted to tell you. Oh, that's well. Uh, I'll call you back, darling. I've got to listen to Giles and Barton. All right, Joe. Put you back. So killing the guard is out. Maybe somehow we can get into a fight. Be badly hurt. Uh, even then, I don't think they'd let us out of this cell. Oh, I'm gonna turn in, Charles. I'm all in. My brain won't work. <laughs> As if my brain starts to work the best. I don't want to stay cooped up in this cell the rest of my life. All right, go to sleep. Let me do the thinking. Uh, I wish I'd been a Sunday school teacher. What's the matter, Barton? Think you're dreaming? Huh? You all finished? Sure. Say, you done stir crazy, Charles? Why? What's the matter? You thought I was asleep, but I've been watching you for an hour, putting water through that little hole in the wall. <laughs> no, Savvy? What's the gag? The cops have got a microphone in the wall. What? They've been listening for days to every word we've said. How do you know? I sounded the wall. Well, why didn't you tell me? I wouldn't have said some of the things I did. I wanted you to talk just like you didn't know. You were making up all those crackpot ideas to escape. You kept them busy, their minds occupied. Well, I was doing some special thinking to myself. Yeah, but why the water? Can't they hear us now? Water short circuits wires, Barton. That's what I've been pouring it through this little hole in the wall for. They'll think just something has gone wrong with the amplifier. While they're sending for a radio repairman, we'll do our real planning. Have you thought of something? We're going to start out of here in about two minutes. Listen, you wouldn't kid me. You wouldn't kid me. Lord, I... We didn't have anything to work with. But I made something. I chewed up part of a paper plate till it was a pulp. Yeah? Then I chewed up a few cigarette papers. And using that as a plastic, I pushed it into the cell lock here. And I got an impression of the lock. Holy smokes, but what good will that do? Then I used both of our toothbrushes. By rubbing them on the sharp corners of the cell, I shaped them with the right notches and curves. And those brush handles will unlock the lock. Oh, you're crazy, Charles. It wouldn't be possible. Then you stay here. I'm leaving. Just outside in the garage is a blue police car. The door of the garage is steel. But if the car hits it hard enough... I think it'll give. I don't know whether I'm awake or dreaming. Here. Here's the toothbrush handle. Let's get started. If you can open that big ten lock with that rig. 
Ah, oh, it can't be done, Doc. Wait, it's open. Holy smokes, I'm straight. Come on. So you come out of the movies. How'd you like it? Well, not bad. You haven't got a bad little town here. This uh, Concord, New Hampshire don't take second place to any town. You know, there's a lot of excitement in town today. Yeah, why? That criminal Giles, you know, in the papers. Yeah? They found the car he'd been driving in town in a parking lot last night. They said, oh, give you a <laughs> Yeah, okay, bud. Don't, don't move a muscle, Giles. There are four officers who've come up behind you with submachine guns. They'll cut you in two. So that was the store, huh? And I fell for it. Yeah. And we have your pal Cook, too. Remember, boys, this guy killed one chief of police without giving him a chance. Welcome to Alcatraz. Giles, step out. You have a nice sea breeze out here, Dodd. Well, Giles, you're supposed to be an escape artist. But never since Alcatraz was built has a man successfully escaped. Not yet, huh? Not yet. It's two miles to the coast of California. The tides run eight miles an hour and can't be swum. The prisoners are not allowed to talk to each other. The prisoners are counted every 30 minutes. Oh, you guys here can count, huh? You're assigned to the laundry. Pressing clothes. You're doing the laundry for the army now. And besides, Giles, a cop killer isn't very welcome at Alcatraz. All right, men. Start marching to your assigned place. They'll stick me in the laundry with this steam pressure. Let me talk to anybody. Hey. Yeah. They made a mistake by letting me help load the wash into the army boat with the docks. Mm -hmm. The guy could get a GI outfit. Pants, shirt, belt, and socks. He might slip on board the boat when it's leaving. Yeah. But you can't steal an outfit all at once. You gotta be patient. A year, maybe. Yeah, one thing at a time. Hide in the dock, and everything must fit me exactly, or I'd be noticed when I go on board. Yeah. Cast 
all boards I can find. I'm going aboard then. Yeah, they sail right off, huh? As soon as we get the gangway up, Sergeant. That's the stuff. Every trip, the sooner we can get away from this Alcatraz dock, the better I like it. What's the matter, Sergeant? Cold? No, no, I just... Just thought I'd sit down here behind the lifeboat. Take a little rest. That's quite a sight, isn't it? Alcatraz fading in the distance. Yeah. I hate that dump. Some of those guys in there are pretty tough babies, huh? Yeah. Just a fellow in there has a pretty helpless feeling. See nobody ever escape. Yeah. Not like sitting out here with the wind and the sea. Yeah. This is great. Orders have just come through. There's some trouble. Yeah? I just came from the radio house. They just made their 30 minute count at Alcatraz, and one of them cards is missing. Holy smokes. A fellow by the name of Giles. He's a cop killer. Hey, wait a minute. You mean radio says one of them Alcatraz guys is on our ship? Yeah, fairly tall guy. Good looking. They're going to start a search. Oh, look, guys. If there's a killer like that on the ship, what'll they do? They're swinging now, see? We're starting to head back to the rock. We're heading back to the rock? Yeah. What's the matter? You seasick? Yeah, I guess I'll go off the rail. What's the matter with him? You notice how he acted? I don't think he's seasick. Hey, I'll bet you. I don't recognize him. I'll bet you he's... Hey, he's starting to climb the rail. That's Giles. Sure, he's going to commit suicide. Come on, let's rush him. Get back. Well, Giles, okay. Okay, you got me. I'm through. I'm washed up. Yeah, washed up. But keeps. I'll go back to the rock. Die there. Giles attempted that escape less than two months ago, Commissioner Valentine. July 31st. And I understand, Chief Halverson, that his failure broke him. He's no longer the escape artist, but a, but a broken wreck of a man. Yes, Commissioner. John K. Giles has no more spirit left. You might call him a, a walking dead man behind those massive walls of Alcatraz. Well, Chief Halverson... This has been a terrific case and just proves again that crime cannot pay. For next week, same time, same station, listen to Gangbusters.